Hello everybody and welcome back! It's Creative Redancy back again, also known as CR Creative, and you can also call me TLC, by the way. <laughs> so I want to welcome everyone on this stream slash replay to this preparedness chat. So it's going to be about general overall preparedness and emergency situations. And things to keep in mind, some tips and some hits and all that stuff. So like I said, things to keep in mind, what one can do to be a little bit more prepared. Because like I say in my outro, as the world changes, so much oneself, right? If I'm having extra supplies on hand, basic areas to cover, having ready-to-go kits, like a bug out bag, an emergency preparedness bay. Gear and supplies are good to have on hand, but knowledge, skills, and the will or that mindset make that gear or supplies work the best it can be. And remember, we all can create a better future starting today. I do have links down in the description down below on previous videos that I've done before. Including the emergency preparedness bag challenge, the lights out blackout kit, the extreme fire starting challenge in sub-zero conditions, which was very cold, the urban garbage survival kit challenge, the festival essentials bag plus tips video, me trying out and testing out outside uh, one of those emergency uh, mylar space reflective blankets. And the water kit that I did, and the supplemental survival tin or kit. So the links are in the description right now, so you can go check that out. So let me just whip out the intro here real quick, and all that good stuff. And spark your interest in preparedness right now. Boom! CR's in the house. Hello. And you can see I got my stage prop for this. For this stream. I got that other one that I made just in a previous live stream that I did in live creation mode. So yes. I'm going to be talking about preparedness in this stream. So obviously survivalism. And things you, you can do, things to keep in mind, some tips, and kind of, you know, general preparedness. And things you can do. And I actually have a bunch of examples sitting right behind me. You'll see a couple sneak peeks on a few things, things you might not have seen in previous videos. Or uh, live streams. Yeah. <laughs> I just got a full. There's like. Full of stuff right behind me. I've been gathering it up. Before this live stream. And all that. Good stuff. Let me just pop up the side chat right now. So I can actually see what's up. Let's see here. There we go. Alright, there we go. I'll be welcoming everyone in the chat. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to drop in. I'm not done derail it by waving and all that stuff, but I will say hi to everyone in the chat. In the side chat. So. Probably first and foremost. plan of action getting started I mean sometimes it can feel daunting getting into it 
You know, you see all these videos out there. I mean, there's lots of information on the tube, on the World Wide Web, on the internet about this stuff. But where do you really kind of get started? Well, you know, it starts from in here first. The mind. The willingness to start. To start this kind of creation of making or creating a better future by starting today. So while you're like kind of watching me or listening to me, you probably could even just start doing stuff right now if you haven't already started preparing. Because things in the world are changing. Things are changing. And do things happen. You know, right now it's October. Winter's coming up. So I've been preparing some winter stuff in advance. So, for example, And I actually I'm bring this back as a stage prop again, but it's not come back. So things like winter gear, like gloves, like this pink one I have, which actually I'm gonna put on too. They're not matching. Yes, <laughs> I got pink gloves on for this stream. But it inclu also includes stuff like mitts. Mitts are good. You got this, you know, maybe it's ready to go, maybe it's like in your closet, kind of, or you're not getting it out soon. You know, that's a form of preparedness, you know, and getting ready for winter. Especially here in Canada, it gets cold. So, having this stuff kind of in a ready-to-go state, you know, could save you a lot of time in the long run. So, you're not fussing or mussing and trying to find stuff when you're, uh, when it starts getting colder, like next month, December, January, and so forth. Things like a toque. Like this one right here. I know. See? I do actually. I know. I'm swearing the pink. This could be a wool hat. This is just a polyester one, but this could be a wool hat. Stuff like that. That's a form of preparedness. If, you're, if you got that set back and stuff like that, that's a form of preparedness right there. And welcome everyone that's dropping in right now. I'm just going to say hi to everyone in the chat. Well, and everyone that's coming in. So I'm going to be covering a lot of areas. See, I have it written down right here. You can actually see. I'm going to be covering those areas. These are the areas that I try to cover. You can see it. Screen captured or whatever. So I'm going to be covering these areas. And a few other things as I go along. So yeah, general preparedness chat. So yeah, starting with... You know, simple things you could do. You know, getting things ready, like winter stuff, like gloves, he, um, hats, mitts, and stuff like that. Now, when you're first starting off, like I said, it can feel daunting. You know, where do you start? Well, there's at least a couple main categories or sections, I should say, that regardless of who you are, where you come from, wherever you are in this world, this third world from the sun, these are very, very necessary things. At least two, at least two of them are very, very necessary, and I have them written down, which include water, which includes subsections like cooling and hydration and food which includes subsections like energy and cooking those are probably the most 
two most important things. Because we can't live, humans, and everything on this planet can't really live without food, energy, in terms of like calories, and water. Water, water is like the elixir of life. Without water, you ain't going far. Can only go a few days or less, give or take, without water. Now I do realize that some there's been stories that people have surviving with water without water, but usually that's because they're in a cool spot and stuff like that. But you ain't gonna go longer than a couple days without water and food. Yeah, you could go like they say a longer period of time without food, but the thing is, without the energy to keep doing stuff. You're going to start feeling tired, exhausted. You're not going to have that mental energy to keep thinking correctly and stuff like that. After a couple of days without food, you might start, you know, not thinking straight, not making the right choices and stuff like that. And thank you, yes, yes. Those are the two, the most, two most important areas to cover. And I'm going to cover, well, those areas in a little bit more detail. There's a couple of examples I have in the back about food and water. So I'm going to start with that first. So here's an example. Of something that you can, uh stockpile have in reserve canned food like something like what I have here now obviously you want to rotate that stuff keep it fresh as long as I should say you should keep rotating it so the fresh stuff's up front you're using that that first and then the, uh, the stuff in the back is cover probably the stuff that's uh, not expire or go bad until like, you know, a couple years later and stuff like that. So, you know, consume the stuff that's not uh, go bad, expire first. And when you're stockpiling food, you know, setting it back and stuff, remember, stockpile stuff that you want to eat. If you don't like it, well, don't stockpile it. If you don't like beans, well, don't stockpile beans. If you like beans, well, stockpile that. If you like soups or something like that, you know, maybe stockpile that kind of stuff. Maybe just ha um, buying like an extra can or two every week. That little things can add up over time. And if you ever see like discounts, clearance, two for one offers, you know, take advantage of that. Especially if you can get like, now I'm not gonna say you're gonna get a two for one on canned food, but if you see deals on something, maybe buy a little bit extra of it. Especially if this is food you're gonna consume anyways, you know, you can always still consume it later. So just in case, you know, something happens, you know, Grocery stores don't have that resupply and stuff like that. You have things on hand. So, for example, during hurricane season out east in the eastern part of Atlanta, Canada, in in and in the U.S. Right, you you might not be able to go to a store to go get food. There might not be food on the shelves. But if you have a little bit of stock piled up, you can uh, buy yourself some more time until hopefully that stuff comes back. So some more examples of food. I'll show some more examples of food. And I'm actually, I actually brought up like this big bag of it. But Oh, let me get this big bag of rice here. Yeah, this is a big bag of rice right here. This ain't even open yet because, well, I don't need to open it yet. But yeah, this is like 4 kilograms of rice right here. 
as an example, I actually do have more rice. Like, a lot more rice. Probably, like, 100 pounds of it. Stockpile on this. I mean, this kind of stuff will go for a long period of time. It will give you carbohydrates that you need. And, you know, you can uh, kind of get complementary proteins if you mix this with, like, something like beans, for example, and get complementary proteins. So you can't get, per se, meat. Well, beans and rice. And maybe a little bit of oil or something like that for, like, uh, fat. Could sustain you a little bit longer, buy you some more time and stuff like that. So this is just an example of some rice that I have right here. Let me put this heavy bag of rice down. Hold on a sec. Another food option you could have. Now, I don't have this stuff a lot of the time, but it's good to have on standby. It doesn't take long to prepare it. It's something like this. Something like ramen noodles, noodles and stuff like that. Maybe you can get it on a discount, get it on sale. I mean, if I take a look at this stuff, this doesn't even expire until 2020 of next year. So I got, so if anything happened in between, at least I can have one of these maybe for at least one meal right here. This could be six meals. This could buy for one, a single person anyways. I'm assuming just a single person. If you have more family members, obviously you need more of this stuff to sustain it. And I'll get into the water in just a little bit here. But something like this, this is probably good for, for one person at least, for at least a couple of days. That's a couple of days of worth of meals right there. Now you're probably not going to get that much out of it. I mean... This one container, it says 340 calories, 15 grams of fat, there's a little bit of protein, and some fiber and carbohydrates. So something like this. I think I actually got that on uh, on sale. So I was just like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I'm pretty sure I'll consume it before the Best Buy or the per se expiry. Let's just gonna read the chat real quick. I do appreciate everyone dropping by on this preparedness chat where I'm sharing a few things, and some tips, things to keep in mind. And maybe you kind of spark your interest in creating a better future starting today and preparing a little bit more and get into the prepping, prepare this a little bit more. Oh, I, I know, I know. That that's that's just a emergency supply. I don't like that as much. I'm not a big fan of it to be honest. To be honest, I'd rather have the rice. <laughs> I'd rather have the rice than the noodles. But I got that on a discounted so for fairly cheap. And of course, I can bring that on a camping trip or something like that if I wanted to. And eventually consume it. And hello to everyone. I appreciate everyone dropping in. I can see you guys chatting on the side chat right now. I appreciate everyone dropping in, taking a little bit of time to drop in, checking out this preparedness chat that I have. And like I said, I have my list right here. These are sections or categories that I keep in mind. And I'll be going through this. But, like I said, probably the most two most important things is going to be the water and the hydration and the food, calories, and energy. 
because, like I said, water's the elixir of life. Food is necessary because we need energy as, well, as living organisms, right? As humans, we need that energy to keep doing stuff, to keep moving forward and stuff like that. If you don't have that, you'll start getting tired, you start not thinking correctly, and your decision making or problem solving skills kind of drop because you don't have the energy to keep this, right, the mind, which is really important. To keep it going. Of course, no problem, man. No problem. True, true. Some food is probably gonna be better than I. Like I said, you could probably go a couple days without food, baby and longer but over time you're gonna start feeling tired exhausted not wanting to do anything and stuff like that and like i said when you stockpile up food stockpile up food or have it set back a food that you actually enjoy eating if you don't like it don't have it don't have it Right? I mean, like, stop all food that you enjoy eating. Now, speak of food, you might be thinking, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't have that much, or food's expensive, or something like that. Well, there's, there's alt maybe alternatives to consider, such as, right now, it's fall time in the norm Northern Hemisphere. Harvest time. So maybe you're, you can supplement some of this food that you're stockpiling got on sale, discounted, like rice, beans, for example, or those noodles I have, with stuff that you can get from like a garden, from a tree, from a bush. So I have an example right here of actual like stuff that I actually har well harvest or gathered. Including all these apples. These are all apples from an apple tree. These are local. Now you can preserve these to make them last longer and stuff like that. But these could kind of supplement or increase your food supply a little bit longer, for example. Now, I have this emergency food ration right here, which was graciously uh, gifted to me by one of my subscribers. So I appreciate the gift, by the way. Now, to me, this is more like emergency food. This is like last-ditch kind of food. Because most these rations are mostly filled with, like, I, you know... It's mostly like carbohydrates, simple sugars, and stuff like that. Because if I look at this, uh, about 60% of this is carbohydrates. I mean, there's some fats and stuff like that. So you can mix this in with like water and something like that and have it. Maybe have something like this. Now, depending on when you buy it, it's up to a five years shelf life. Uh, this one right here expires, you can see right there, May of 2021, I believe. I believe that's when, the, yeah. Yeah, because I think that's the production, uh, when it was made, and that's when it expires. So 2021, so I still got, let's see, uh, about a year and a half on this, at least. And something like this, should be able to handle like being stored in hot or cold climates quite easily. So this could be an option, but this would be a last ditch option. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Those Nor Rice sidekicks. Yeah, I got a few of them. 
I gotta actually uh, pick up some more eventually. Running, it's starting to run dry on it. I think I'm down to the last few. But I mean, that's the stuff I consume on more of a regular basis. So I don't mind stockpiling something like that because it's actually something I would actually eat. And like I said, stockpile food that you would actually eat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just reading the chat real quick. Just making sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, so let's see, what else? Um, well, the food also includes the cooking part of it. Because a lot of that stuff, unless it's like, um... Uh, I mean, this kind of stuff right here. These rations, an apple like this, maybe uh, peanut butter, crackers. They don't require cooking. So you don't have to like heat up water or anything like that. Like for example, like for a uh, freeze dry, something like Mountain House or something like that. So these would be suitable for situations where, hey, I can't cook, but I, at least I can have some energy. You know, keep keep going, buy you some more time until things come back. For example, like you're in a hurricane area, you know, this can buy you more time until those services come back. You know, like the grid and all that stuff when things are, you know, safe again. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about is the water part of it, which includes what I call cooling and hydration. Because water, like I said, is the elixir of life. You can't, you can go longer without food per se, but you're not going to go that long without water or some sort of hydration of some sort. So there's water filters out there. There's options like bleach, pool shark, uh, water, pur water purification tablets, and stuff like that. And their incubation period, or the time it takes for it to like work, it varies depending on what you're using. Some of them take longer, some of them could be as, long, as short as 15 minutes, some of them can take as long as 4 hours. And something like using like uh, UV light, like solar can take like six to eight hours in direct sunlight it's not the heat that does it it's the uv light that disinfects the water at least makes it biologically safe that's assuming you have fairly clear water the more turbulent the more stuff that's in it well you probably want to pre-filter it as much as possible maybe use like i said something like a water filter life straw Sawyer, something similar to that. Maybe pre-filter in a coffee filter with a bandana or something like that beforehand. And usually, for the most part, it's not the water that, per se, the water that makes it go bad. It's actually the container that it's in. That kind of makes it stale and stuff like that. So you want to kind of rotate that as much as you can every so often. Keep it as fresh as possible, just like the food, try to keep it as fresh as possible. Consuming the stuff that's done go bad sooner. Well, sooner, I guess. So I want to welcome everyone that's coming in right now. Just what I know you were talking about sugar. Something else about food, because I guess I'm going to bounce back to that, is something like honey. Honey, honey is a good, good. It lasts for long periods of time. Even if it kind of gets like kind of, how do you say, I wouldn't say chunky, but solid, you can heat it up and maybe in some warm water or maybe in the sun, and it'll kind of become gooey again. So something else about water is, well, you're going to need containers. Here's an example of a container that I got right here. You can see, I got that for two bucks. 
at a local kind of secondhand shop and stuff like that. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit later about uh, about uh, preparing on a budget a little bit more. I know not everyone has money. Not everyone has money and stuff like that. Or money's tight and stuff like that. But yeah, you need a container to store water. Especially for anyone that kind of goes hiking, does trips and stuff like that. Maybe you have containers of water, whatever it is. For me here, I like to store water in glass. At least in my fridge right now, I have these uh, glasses glass bottles that I've had from like previous stuff, whatever it, the drink was or water it was. And I like to store water in glass. I don't have to worry about anything like plastic that might leach in or something like that. And it'll go for a while. And because I kept it, keep it in the fridge, it keeps it nice and cool. And if power goes out or whatever, that water will kind of keep that fridge a little bit cooler. And stuff like that. And the best part about like something like a metal container is that you could, if necessary, boil in it and biologically uh, make it safe to drink. Now, if there's other contaminations like chemicals, pesticides, well, you'll have to find other options or a better water source. So you might have to, uh, you know, do distillation, for example, if it was that bad. But also, you want to try to source the best water you can, cycle it and all that stuff. Now, I don't have the example right now, but I've shown videos on this, you know, rain catching. I have a video on that where, well, you can see it was just falling down. It filled it up really fast. That's another option right there. I know some areas don't allow that, but if your area does allow for rain catchment, you know, that could be something to keep in mind. Maybe as a, to supplement some of the water that you do have, like in water bottles, glass containers, jugs, those collapsible water bottles and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll get into that too. I'll get into the first store kind of thing. And the budget thing, you know, just soon. I do appreciate everyone taking a little bit of their time right now to drop it, even for a few minutes. I know some people are probably on their lunch break or something like that. Maybe you're doing something in the background. That's cool. That's cool. Even if you're just listening and not really uh, looking. I do appreciate everyone taking a little bit of their time to drop in. However long. And hopefully spark your interest into preparedness a little bit more. And like I said, we all start from somewhere. We all start from the bottom. But we all can grow, grow, grow. Maybe set back a little bit more and more and more. And gradually have something so in a time of need and an emergency, you'll be glad you had this extra food and water on hand because, you know, grid's down, you can't get to a store, can't get out, there's a storm outside, you know, whatever, hurricanes, earthquakes, whatever it is, you can't get on the road, there's stores aren't open or the stores are maybe cleared off for example i remember this one saying that i heard in this documentary you know we're only like what nine meals away from anarchy something like that i, I kind of remember that something i keep in mind too because when you're when you start getting hungry you know because you know you didn't set back food or whatever you know you may be willing to do things you may not want to do normally just because you're hungry. You know, there's that kind of commercial that says, you know, when you're hungry, you're not yourself. I think that's true. Because without the energy, 
you, you're not thinking straight, and then as time goes on, your body starts to break down its own muscle tissue and stuff like that to kind of give you a little bit of er energy for your ma your for your head, your brain, your major organs, your heart, your lungs, and all that stuff. And then over time, you know, it just gets worse and worse. So let's see, where else should I go? Uh, so I kind of sort of covered about the w food and water, which I do believe are the most two most important things in terms of preparedness and in survival or survivalism as a whole. Because like I said, water is the elixir of life. Food is necessary. Energy in terms of like calories or and you know stuff like uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are important. And of course, you know vitamins and minerals and all that stuff. And since I'm kind of talking about that, that reminds me about food. You need water. To digest food so you if you haven't drunk anything for a while maybe not consume food right away because if you consume food it will draw water out of your system to help you digest that food because uh well let's just say enzymes and stomach acid need to be need water for it in your tummy in your stomach and something like Fats and proteins take a little bit more water to digest than compared to carbohydrates. Like simple carbohydrates, like sugars, all the way to starchy foods, which are complex carbohydrates. Now sugars will give you that kind of, simple sugars will kind of give you that very fast boost of energy, but it doesn't last long. But uh, complex carbohydrates take longer for you to get that energy but they last longer I mean that's just something I've learned back in school a long time ago learning about cooking and stuff like that so yeah like I said earlier you know pots and pans and stuff like that ways to cook it on or cook it in is important too especially if you're trying to cook rice and beans and stuff like that and, and beans need to be soaked beforehand, before cooking. And rice, well, definitely needs water, for sure. So this next area, see, I have this list right here. It's not in any particular order. These are just seven sections that I keep in mind. Especially trying to prepare more. Maybe I'm making a survival kit, bag, pouch, whatever. You know, these are areas I try to keep in mind, as best as I can. So the next area I'm going to cover is actually the shelter part. Shelter, cover, and clothing, which all are part of it. So clothing is a part of shelter. A home is part of your shelter. A car could be part of a shelter. So this includes stuff like tarps, tents, clothing items, like this pink hat, or this pink glove I have. I mean, this is a form of shelter. We just know it more commonly as clothing. I mean, especially this kind of stuff is going to be important, especially the colder it is. As in most situations, uh, the elements will get to you most likely first. They're, it's more likely that elements will get to you. But if you're, you know, more prepared, you know, you can handle more than a couple hours. I remember this, and as an example here, I remember this one time being out on the lake, out in the middle of winter and all, stuff like that. And we were out there for a long, for a couple hours. Now, the shelter and the clothing bought us time. Bought us time. Now, it was sub-zero. Well, I should say sub-30 or minus 30 Celsius or minus 22 Fahrenheit. If we didn't have proper clothing 
and a little bit of shelter, uh, you know, it would have been, we wouldn't be able to handle it as much. But, you know, clothing and shelter buy you a little bit more time against the elements. You know, stuff like a rain poncho, a jacket, and stuff like that will block the wind. You know, keep that rain and water off of you. Because water, as a whole, yes, it's good for hydration and stuff like that. But if you get wet, for the most part, water will pull heat away from your body much faster than if you were dry. Because of, well, water is, um, it, it absorbs energy or heat, a, a lot of heat. It takes a, a lot of heat to, you know, boil water, for example, or a lot of energy to boil water. It, it has, um, it, as a scientific kind of phrase or term, it has a very high specific heat capacity, so it can hold a lot of heat, so... And if, if your skin's wet or your clothing's wet and there's wind or wind shield, it's uh, suck that heat away from you so much faster. Now, something like wool will kind of, is usually a better option, especially in the winter, in comparison to something like cotton. Because cotton... It may be good for like summertime to keep cool, you know, allows water to evaporate and stuff like that, your sweat and stuff like that. You may feel cooler and stuff like that, but during the winter, nope, because if it gets wet, it loses all of its heat retention value. While something like wool, even though it's wet, it might not be as good when it's dry, but it'll still, it won't be as bad as something as cotton. And something like polyester is kind of more neutral. Synthetic materials will probably be more neutral. When they get wet and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome to hear. That's awesome to hear that you got... A lot more winter clothing. I mean, like I said, it, living here in Canada, it gets cold. It gets cold. That's why I have this kind of stuff. Even extras. Even colors that I may not wear all the time. Like this hat. Or this pink glove. Because if you were really desperate, you probably won't care what color it is. Because it's keeping you warm, it's, you know, keeping your head warm, keeping your hands warm. So, coming back to the shelter part real quick here. Our options are and this is more of a multi-use item, I guess, too, but Trash bags. Now, specifically, I have these contractor bags right here. I actually have a few of them, <laughs> to say the least. And you can easily get that at, like, a hardware store, for example. Wherever you are in the world, you probably could get something similar to something like this. Um, try to get the thickest ones you can. Maybe, you know, two and a half, three mil, or thicker, if you can. These are quite multi-functional, not just for trash and stuff like that, but you can easily open them up, put a couple holes for your head and your arms to make something like an uh, impromptu, improvised poncho. I mean, I've used a contractor bag before for shell, uh, as a rain poncho because, well, it randomly rained. And not only did it randomly rain on me this one time, it was about 10 Celsius, 50 Fahrenheit. I was glad I had something like this. Because I was just like, if I got, because at that temperature, you know, and it's windy, when you're wet, you don't feel cold. But if you could stay dry with like a contractor bag, garbage bag, 
Assuming you don't already have like a jacket, a waterproof jacket, a poncho on, you know, it's useful. I keep a bunch of these. I keep a bunch of these in my kind of bags too, because it's multifunctional. I can store gather water in it. It's a form of shelter or cover if you if you're uh you know into or know about the tendencies of survivability from Dave Canterbury, right? It's a form of cover. One of the tendencies right here, cover. Now, I'm going to bring up a story here and an example of another form of cover. And, well, it's an umbrella. You're probably like, oh, CR, you just use an umbrella when it rains, right? And yes, I'm going to open it up inside, I know. But, an umbrella could be a form of shelter. Or at least give you something. It covers you from, like, rain, obviously. Let me put that to the side. So you can actually see my heading. But, this could be blocking the wind. So maybe you're slightly damp or something. Well, the wind's not the... Hit you right away. It's not gonna blow that heat away from you because you're slightly damp and stuff like that. I mean, I have a... When I was younger... I actually brought an umbrella out to this thing that I had to attend in the winter. No, you you don't need to just use an umbrella during the, during the summer. It's more associated with like spring showers, the summer. But I have used an umbrella before in the winter. Now everyone's like, "Why do you have an umbrella? It's not raining." Well, let's just say. My relative knew what I was up to. He knew. He's, they were just like, yeah, but it blocks the wind. Because it was like sub-zero conditions. And very windy out. Because we were exposed. Because the area that we were in is kind of more open. And my relative actually knew what I was doing. He knew that I was using it as a form of protect, protecting myself against the wind. So the windshield would go, the wind would go around me. And not, you know, through me or around me and, you know, blow that kind of little thin layer of heat that we have escaping from all our bodies all the time. So something like this could be a form of shelter or clothing or cover. I mean, I've used this stuff all the time. And I have a video on it, too. <laughs> so if you want to know how to scrap this and then from a broken one and kind of use reuse the umbrella canopy. I mean, I've done it before. I don't have the example nearby. It's actually in a bag right now. It's, well, actually, I, I keep forgetting. It's actually... I keep forgetting. It's in one of my bags. Let's see. I'll just show it real quick here. You'll see. Right here. This is a form of cover for me, and I have used this. This is an umbrella canopy from an umbrella that wasn't working anymore, you know, whatever, the spokes, the metal banded or whatever. Well, I scrapped that and took the umbrella canopy out. I've used this stuff before. Now, it's not going to be as waterproof as actually having it spread tight across, but I've used it to uh, wrap myself around. I've used it to stick inside my jacket, so I got that dead airspace. Dead airspace is a good insulator, and you know, and keep you a little bit warmer, buy you a little bit more time in the elements and stuff like that. So I do know that there is some people dropping in, so I'm just gonna say hi to them real quick. I do appreciate everyone that's taking a little bit more time to drop by and stuff like that. Hopefully, you spark your interest in preparedness. A little bit more. So welcome to uh, the stream. I appreciate everyone dropping in and taking a little bit of time to drop in on this preparedness chat, where I have links in the in the description down below right now on previous videos I've done.
so you can go check it out. From the emergency preparedness bag challenge to the sub zero, well, extreme fire starting sub zero challenge that I did to try and something out in the middle of uh, sub zero conditions in the winter outside and actually, you know, mimicking like, you know, what you would see on the kind of on the packaging. I was just like, I'm gonna try this out. And I'm gonna get into practicing and trying the gear out and all that stuff in a little bit too. Because that's important too. To actually know try it, try the stuff out. You know, kinda know its limitations, know the characteristics of it, you know, learn learn or know how to make it better if you need to, stuff like that. So I speak speak of that, I do have it on the side here. This is my or space blanket. Oh, and that video and and that thing I talked about about me being outside in the middle of winter. Yeah, this is one of them. this is probably not the exact same one, but this is another, you know, another uh, a secondary one I have. I've used this quite a bit actually from time to time. Now something like a Mylar space blanket, for example. I don't like the cheap ones as much. I I, I don't mind these ones from uh, Survive Outdoor Longer. Soul, S-O-L, however you want to pronounce it. I've tried these before. I don't mind them. For a lightweight option. Now, it's probably not going to be as durable as, let's say, uh, canvas or something like a thicker tent, a thicker tent, a thicker uh, tar, but it's a good lightweight option. And I've used this for both winter and summer and in the rain because it has this reflective quality right here. Now, because these are so thin, and I mentioned it in the video, these are good for blocking wind. It'll block wind because it's kind of plastic. And then the shiny side, which is basically aluminum will reflect radiant heat back towards you. Now, and you know, it'll block convection, so you know, wind and stuff like that. It'll block moisture like rain. You know, if you drape it over you, you know, you can keep a little bit drier. If you have something like a fire or heat source or your body, it'll radiate, reflect that radiant heat back towards you. One, one thing these don't do quite well with is conjunction. So if you have some some way to insulate it, you know, it helps. And they, I think most people, and I usually remember, you want to keep it as close to you as possible without actually direct, directly touching you. Because although these will re reflect radiant heat, block rain, block convection, if you're directly touching it, the, the conduction will kind of override that kind of heat reflection and yes I have what I have actually tried this once it was this year earlier this year when it's minus 40 up that's but I of course I had extra layers on too but I used it as kind of like the outside the outside layer and I had like five or six layers on I kind of used one to kind of block the wind and you know, reflect some of that radiant heat back towards me. So I tried it out when it was minus 40. Uh, and my friend was asking me about it. They are like, hey, what's that? I was like, oh, this is a reflective blanket. And they are like, that works? And I kind of said the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it works. It, you know, it reflects radiant heat. It blocks the wind. You know, repels the water. But you got to watch for conduction loss. And it works. this stuff works better when you have insulation to back it up. I find. Oh, do you? That's cool, that's cool. Yeah, I got a bunch of them. This is just the one I use, use more often. I like, unlike some of the cheaper ones, this is kind of not as crinkly or as loud. I've used this one time to time. 
I've stretched it. I've not ripped one of these yet. Not saying you wouldn't be able to, but I haven't done it yet. Because I'm pretty sure if you put enough pressure on it, it will rip. But it won't cut. It'll, it'll be more durable than some of the cheaper ones. For example. Let me just put it back real quick here. Let's see here. Now, I guess I'm going to really spark everyone's interest on the next kind of area. And there's a lot of videos on this kind of stuff for sure. Lots of kits about fire kits and stuff like that. So I'm going to be talking about, for a little bit, fire, light, and heat. As you can see here, fire, light, and heat. I kind of engulf that as one area. Because fire allows you to have light and heat. And sometimes, well, you need heat, but you can't have a fire for whatever reason. So I'm going to give some options, and light, well, everyone knows what light is. You know, it's that beam. <laughs> so, during the winter time, I don't use these often, because usually I have proper shelter clothing on. But, these are an option if you need it. But, something like... Body warmers like these, these are disposable kind. You can get reusable to kind. But you need to be more careful with the reusable time because sometimes, you know, something can happen and it stops working, for example. These basically are, if I remember right, it's an exothermic reaction. So basically, once it, air can get into it, oxygen, I think there's iron particles and stuff like that, it reacts to it and it radiates or emits heat for however long. You know, these aren't super hot or anything like that. But, you know, you're not getting a... Uh, it'll feel t toasty warm. And you'll... If in the middle of winter, you know, when it's minus 30 Celsius or minus 22 Fahrenheit for you guys in the U.S., you know, they'll help you keep your hands warmer, you know, and buy you a little bit more time in the elements. So if you're going out with kids to go tobogganing and stuff like that, I know people like to have this kind of stuff in addition. So... If you're, uh, you or your kids or whoever you are, uh, whoever you're with, family members and such, you know, these could be useful. They're not too expensive. I bought these, I got these actually, you can see a price there. I actually got that for half the price. But that was a clearance price. Now, I do know of another way of kind of, another tip with these, but I need to test it a little bit more. Because I've tried something before. And I want to try it again, just to make sure it wasn't a, a fluke. But remember what I said about it reacting with oxygen or the air. Keep that in mind, because when I do the video on it, it'll make sense more. So obviously, with fire, you got... Things like lighters, here's a lighter right here. Uh, see, you can see it's almost dead. Or the fuel or gas is almost gone on it. Here's another option right here. Now this, this one is more like a, it sparks. So with a flint wheel, you'll see a flint wheel in there. Here's another example right here. This is an electric spark one. Uh, it just happens to be a clipper. I just happen to have cordage on it. And it just happens to be refillable. And I think I have to refill this soon, eventually. That's an option for a flame option. And stuff like that. And, you know, fire, if you can have it, and, you know, depending on the situation or whatever. I mean, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and alone, you know, fire is going to be your best friend. Most of the time. Most of the time. Although fire is a double-edged sword. 
as useful as it is, you know, it can boil water for you, it can cook your food for you, it can signal, it can keep you warm, you know, so your core body temperature, maintaining core body temperature, so either from using it as heat or boiling water so you can stay hydrated to keep cool after you, you know, let the water kind of cool down. Uh, what else? Drives mosquitoes or bugs away from the smoke and stuff like that. But, like I said, it's a double-edged sword because, well, fire can be dangerous too, you know. When you're, when you're at, and another reminder and tip, right? When you have fires, you like, be careful with those. You don't want to burn the forest down, right? It's easy, you know, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. You don't want to get burnt by the fire. Because it can easily uh, get out of control easily if you don't kind of watch over it, maintain it, and stuff like that. Keep your fires as only as big as necessary. And thanks for everyone dropping in. Big wave to everyone that's dropping in. I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much so. So there's other options. I don't have them because they're actually sitting underneath <laughs> right now. But stuff like matches, stormproof matches, waterproof matches, and stuff like that. So you may be familiar with like the Strike Anywhere matches, the stormproof matches from like a company like uh, UCL or UCO, depending how you want to pronounce it. I've tried out the stormproof matches from them. I like them. They don't. I mean, you gotta be fast with that kind of stuff. I mean, if you got the tiny versions that are a little bit bigger, that last a little bit longer, right? You, when you're doing fire, make sure you got stuff, everything else ready to go. You got the tinder, you got the bird's nest, whatever it is, ready to go. So you're only lighting that later once or twice. So it's like, you know... Everything else is, if I was making a fire right now, for example, not inside, but outside and stuff. I would make sure I have everything else ready to go, you know. I've gathered all the sticks, I've gathered up the pencil size sticks, made some feather sticks, gathered up some extra fuel sources and stuff like that. So when I go light that fire with a lighter, for example, I'm only doing this like... For like once, maybe twice, for a few seconds, get that going, then you know, try to blow it in flame, get some more air into it, and then go from there. Now, I think you know, flame source is important, but lighters aren't you know, they're not bulletproof by any means, useful, useful, but they're not bulletproof per se because obviously, this is more modern day technology to make fire although not saying this is not a modern day technology for making fire but it's a little bit more it can handle elements a little bit more it's a little bit more resistant to water and it doesn't matter if it gets wet some of these lighters if they get wet they're not as great now this electric spark one i could put this in water and it will still light but these lighters are vulnerable to cold. If it gets cold, well, the the fuel the fuel is not uh, wanna be coming up as fast. So anyone that's tried to use a lighter in the winter understands it, it, you get a really short flame. You gotta warm it up. You know, maybe you're using your hands to warm it up, putting it underneath your armpit. Now, if you're wet, you know, from like for example. Uh, rain, wet snow, maybe you fall, fell in the water, ice fishing, canoeing, that kind of thing. A narrative that I learned recently from one of the bigger channels is put it in your mouth. Well, I'm not going to do it, but it's, I've been touching it, but because your mouth will still be warm for a little bit of time. Because your clothing might be wet. Well, that's not the help. Yeah, you can rub it, but maybe your hands are cold. And you're trying, and maybe this is the only source of fire that you have at the moment. 
Because for some reason, you don't have that air stuff that I will mention. Or, it's not sunny, so you can't do solar ignition. <laughs> and you don't have something else to do, to use as an exothermic reaction to create fire with chemicals. So you can put it in your mouth. Which I'm actually going to do, but what the hell. Because <laughs> your mouth will be warm. Still. I kind of... I uh, found that out or learned about it from one of the bigger channels. I was like, yeah, that's a good tip. That's a good tip. So I'm going to spread that. That's something good to keep in mind just in case. Just in case. Now. Sparks. This just happens to be uh, a magnesium bar. This is a... It has a... Well, I guess this was a combo. It has a ferrocium rod in there. And you can see I've used this. So basically, you would take something... Uh that's kind of harder than the steel on the rod to strike it with. Usually it has a 90 degree spine or something like that, like on the back of a knife, for example, and you would strike it. So let me just do this real quick. Now I'm not done push really hard for this. You can see the sparks coming off. Now, when you're using sparks to start a fire, for example, like that, you have to prepare that kind of tinder or bird's nest a little bit probably better than you would if you were using a lighter. Because this gives you a flame. This gives you hot sparks. Now you can shower it and stuff like that. I like to shower it if I can. I'm, I, I prefer holding the striker still and then pulling back on the rod. Because if you do it the other way and go like this, and, like, for example, let's say right here in front of my camera here, that's the, sp I'm not the spark at all, so <laughs> because I'm not that hit sparks against my camera, but instead of going like this, you may push your tinder, your bird's nest, your feather sticks away, but if you draw back on the rod instead, you may, it may, that may not happen, so you're not blowing, well, or driving your uh, tinder away from you. And of course, you can shower it and stuff like that. So, I know a bunch of people are coming into the room here, so I'm just going to quickly say hi to them on, on the side chat right now. And welcome them into the stream real quick here. So, welcome both of you. And thank you for taking the time to drop in. And hopefully, I can uh, literally... <laughs> And metaphorically, spark your interest into preparedness. Yes, I just made that up. <laughs> and yes, I guess that was fun. Oh, yeah, so coming back to this. Now, magnesium. Magnesium, on its own, and when it's more of a solid form, and a lot of it, doesn't really, really burn, per se. But when you scrape, something like this magnesium bar and hit sparks into it it'll burn very very hot very very bright too it'll look very very bright so that might be enough to kind of catch your uh tinder bundle feather sticks maybe it's fat wood you know uh pine knot also it's known as pine knot basically fat wood pine knot fat lighter it's also known as Basically, that's kind of like, uh, it comes from pine trees, for the most part. I think you can get fat wood from other trees, but it's mostly known with, uh, with pine trees. And basically, when you're smelling it, it smells like uh, turpentine. Or, yeah, turpentine. It has a really strong smell. You, you won't miss that smell when you smell it. And usually, it has like a golden red type of color to it. You'll see the resin in it. That's kind of what's the flammability of it. Usually you see it in the the stump of a dead pine tree, for example. You might see it in the limb part right underneath. So if this was a pine tree, it would be right around there. Assuming that my arm's the branch, for example. Yes, exactly. You know, like I said, fire is a double-edged sword. You may or may not want it. 
It's useful for a lot of things, but it may draw unwanted attention and stuff like that. And you may not have access to it. You may not have access to it. You know, you might not have the resources for it. Or you might have to conserve it or have a smaller one, for example. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you can get bigger ferrocium rods, ferro rods and stuff like that. And the larger or wider it is, well, there's more of it. So you're removing more material off the ferrocium rod. So the sparks are going to be hotter, last longer. And, you know, they're going to be not like this, but like this. And for anyone that drives and stuff like that, an, op an option is like a road flare. I would consider that as a spark option, you know, as an emergency option for making fire with a flare if you needed one, if it was required. And of course, a flare will give you light and stuff like that. Good for signaling purposes, too. And I almost forgot, you know, fire can be used for signaling purposes from the smoke and the light and all that stuff. The next option here is... I'm fine. Actually, hold on a sec. I thought I had I had one nearby, so I'll just have to go grab one that I actually have on me right now. I actually carry one. Next thing is well, these heat sources, well, which I call as heat options for fire, which include solar ignition, like this magnification lens right here, or a reflector, but basically. One of these or a reflector. Basically, you're using con concentrated sunlight, so it's got to be fairly bright out. Fairly bright out. Obviously, this is not when you're on work during daytime. It's more e effective the brighter the sun is. You can do it in marginal sun, and it is even possible, because I've shown this twice now, to do it. In sun showers or in sun flurries, it just depends where the sun is in relation to where the snow or precipitation is falling. So, for example, let's pretend my uh, right here. Let's pretend that's west. Up here, that's south, and uh, over here is east. For example, sometimes in sun showers, what will happen is. And, you know, you'll see rainbows and all that stuff. But sometimes the sun could be over here. The rays are coming down, but the rain is coming from above you. So there's rain. It's raining. Or showers, anyways. Maybe light. I don't think it would be that heavy, but there's still sunlight coming through. You could. It is possible because I've shown solar ignition even in, in the rain. In light rain. Because it was... A sun shower. We go, we're familiar with that. I've done it. Now, it works better, per se, if you have a larger lens. But I actually showed solar ignition when there were sun showers. Because the sun was more west, but the rain or water coming down was from right above. So I still had access to this light, but it's raining or showering slightly. You know, spitting or whatever, right? And I've showed solar ignition with that before. I, I've even sh shown solar ignition with sun flurries before. It is possible. It is possible. It's harder. It's definitely harder. It's definitely harder. By, by no means is it easy. And it's definitely not as fast as, you know, being out in, like, midday sun when it's clear out. Because obviously, the brighter it is, the faster solar ignition will work. And the more cloud cover there is, well, the more likely it won't work or it'll take longer. I've shown solar ignition with with a can before, like a pop can before, using using the, the bottom of it, shining it up, and using that with solar ignition. But usually, uh, solar ignition is probably not 
as reliable because obviously you can only do it during the day when, when it's sunny out. If it's totally cloudy out, well, you're not going to be able to get sword ignition. But if you do have access to sun, well, you can do sword ignition. And maybe uh, conserve your resources, you know, conserve the get, uh, the fuel in your lighter. Oops, I'm dropping stuff. <laughs> As my lighter falls off. Conserve your resources in your lighter. Conserve, like, the, uh, your uh, magnesium or your uh, ferrocene rod. Because you're not using... Re um, using up resources, at least to create the fire, you know, so, you know, conserve, so you have a little more, uh, sparks for later, more fuel for later if need be. So let me just put this away here real quick, <laughs> before I forget. So coming back to the heat part, I consider like exothermic chemical reaction fires and um, friction fire. So bow drill, hand drill, and all that stuff is a form of he a heat method of making fire. It's basically you generate heat, and then you generally will blow that into flame. Generally speaking, now solar ignition you can't create a flame from it, but usually you need a lot bigger lens or reflector and generally you need bright sun thoroughly bright sun for it and usually it has to be like you know afternoon time midday and stuff like that so here's an example of <laughs> a bow drill that I'm attempting here's a skateboard wheel that I have that reduces the friction on the top so I can get the friction to the bottom of the hearth board and this would be my bearing block and you know I use a bow with some cordage and spin it apply pressure and then gradually speed it up and hopefully create an amber that I can put in a bird's nest tinder bundle and blow that into flame and for the most part when you're using solar ignition you probably don't blow something into flame using something like I think I have it on. Hold on a sec. I thought I had it here, but. <laughs> I thought I had this piece of char material nearby. I'm going to show you guys some uh, char cloth here. I'm not sure if I have it nearby. I thought I had it nearby. Well, basically, char cloth or char punk wood, if you're making it out with natural materials, is basically, you know, a form of, well, it's carbon. And basically, it's like a swatch of, well, similar, a swatch version of, like, char coal. I know when I explain, <laughs> when I'm making char cloth to people, I kind of explain it like that. I say to them, yeah, it's kind of similar to charcoal, because people can understand that kind of stuff. I'll be like, yeah, it's similar to charcoal, but it's in a swatch or a fabric version, uh, form, or wood if you're using uh, punk wood. And basically, char cloth is basically when it's been heated up in the absence of oxygen, and basically... Everything else, like the hydrogen and everything else, the rest of it kind of burns away, smokes away, and all that's left is a piece of carbon. And carbon reacts with oxygen very easily, very easily, very, very easily, right? You know, that's why you have CO2, carbon dioxide, CO2. And then because you have a few... A fuel source, heat, and air, well, you can get combustion. And combustion is, a, is one of the better tendencies of survivability that you may have heard or seen from, like, Dave Canterbury, for example. And other people kind of 
quoted every so often and stuff like that. Like, I, you know, I make sure I have, you know, the 10 C's if I can. I, but I also have my own kind of checklist that I do. So I want to welcome, welcome everyone that's dropping in right now. I do appreciate people taking the time to drop in. Those are uh, very, uh, very nice of everyone to drop in. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to just mention that, too. If you can see, this is almost out of fuel. fuel. You can still get a spark off that. Well, spark like this could be used to ignite something relatively easy, like, uh, let's say, well, because I'm not going to do the Tinder part in a little bit, but something like a con ball. Char cloth, char punk wood. No, not sure why I don't see it. Here. Of course, now I can't find that. <laughs> I had this little tin nearby. I thought I had it nearby. I had some like char cloth already. I have more char cloth, but it's actually buried right now because it's actually sitting underneath my computer right now, so I can't get access to it, or else I would have to move it. But you'll have to take my word for it. Uh, see, here's another lighter right here. All right, spark like that could be used. So, for example, here, um, let me just go get something here. Now, anyone watching, you know, be careful with fire and stuff like that. I'm just gonna give it a little bit, little itty bitty piece of con right here, right here. I'm just gonna do this real, really fast. And um, I'll just use this, set this can right here so you can kind of see it <laughs> or not because <laughs> I dropped it. All right. So you'll see this lighter is dead. There is no fuel on it. And I'll even, just to show you guys, I'm pushing this down. There is, oh, there's barely a flame. There's barely a flame. Barely a flame. So let me uh, show you guys real quick. That's a piece of con, but yeah, a dead lighter could be used still, and it's kind of like a spark-based method. It's kind of kind of thinking of it like a like a mini ferrocene rod. I just the sparks are a lot cooler in comparison and a lot smaller than a ferrocene rod. But you'll see there. Yeah, see. Let me put that out real quick. And that's just a piece of con, for example. So, like con pad, con balls and stuff like that. You can actually do it with uh, jutwine, dryer wind and stuff like that too. Those things will, or even cattail, I guess, too. So, you can do that. So, yeah, a dead lighter could still be used for fire. You just need to find sources of tinder that can I kind of accept that spark they'll have to be really really fine really really fine you know like a piece of con and stuff like that something as fine as con uh, let's see here oh yeah tinder tinder I guess I have an example here I think there's going to be two categories for Tinder here when you're thinking about it. There's natural sources, natural sources from nature that you may see outside or whatever in the forest, in the woods, in the countryside and stuff like that. Then there's going to be more, uh, more man-made stuff like con, like con balls, con pads, jute. Well, Jutwine's kind of in between, I guess, because it's actually made from natural materials, but it's spun together, if I remember right. Uh, so yeah, dryer lint and stuff like that. Here's an example right here of, yep, yeah, right here. Here's a piece of uh, fat wood here, right here. It's kind of a small version of it. Show you guys a little bit here. 
you'll see that darkness in there, that's kind of a resin. And when you smell it, you'll smell that kind of pine scent. The stronger that smell is, the more is in there. And that's the stuff that kind of holds that flame or catches that spark, depending if you're using a flame or a spark source. Now, if you're using a spark source, generally speaking, you'll have to refine that something like this fat wood. You'll have to make shavings or scrapings of it so it, it's easier for the sparks to catch. And generally speaking, fat wood is waterproof, generally speaking. But it can dry out, especially if it's left out in the open for a long period of time, exposed to, you know, like, out in the sun. It may start drying out, but the center may still be good. So that's an example where they're of more natural tinder. There's other natural tinders like, uh, like I said, cattail. Uh, birch bark is pretty good too. Why I've, I, I should have actually uh, put the link for that video where I sparked up some uh, birch bark. It's very interesting. Oh, and and because you you were because you and I was talking about the dead lighter. A dead lighter can spark birch bark too. You just have to refine it down. Using some some a cutting tool like you know, a knife, maybe on a multi tool, fixed blade knife, maybe a folder you have, a pocket knife that you may have. So similar to the one that I'm trying to bring out of my pocket right now. Swiss Army knife. Right here. Something like this. So when you're, uh, you you would scrape it or cut into it so it's very as thin as possible. The thinner something is, especially if, in this case tinder, it'll take the spark easier because it'll transmit that spark and kind of heat it up, and then you know it'll want to combust more easily. Because one thing that I learned a long time ago and a wise wise teacher once told me the secret to fire is surface area is surface area and i i remember that now and then i always kind of say it every so often but it's something i keep in mind because it's true surface area is the key to fire either the lack of or the lack of surface area or increasing the surface area, depending on what you're trying to do. Because if you're trying to do solar ignition, for example, well, you want to reduce the surface area and try to squish it together. So when you hit the solar ignition, the beam of light, right, a concentrated beam of light towards it, you're, it's going to heat it up, start burning it, and create an amber. If you're trying to use, like, sparks or an open flame source like a lighter, or use something like a, a magnesium bark, combo like this one right here that has a ferrocium rod on it ferro rod on it you probably want to increase the surface area so the sparks will kind of start it i see people dropping in thank you for taking the time to drop in i appreciate it saying hi to everyone in the chat i do appreciate everyone taking the time to drop by and maybe uh Literally and figuratively and metaphorically spark your interest into preparedness. So I think I'm not like I bit I talked about the fire part a little bit longer than I probably should have, but let me just put this down here, put this all the stuff back before I forget. So yeah, um, let's see what else. Let me go into this next area here. See, I have it written down right here. These are areas that I keep in mind. Now, like I said, you may know of the 10 C's of survivability from Dave Canterbury, but I, I always have my own kind of checklist to keep in mind, which I'm starting to get into which kind of started with water and food because those are the 
very absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. You can't go long without that whatsoever. Then I went into the shelter, cover park, clothing. I just went through this fire and heat. And of course light, you know, is anything from, uh, well, a flame, I guess. To, you know, to a flashlight, headlamp. Stuff like that. Because you may want to be able to see things. Especially in certain situations where you're traveling at night. You don't want to stumble and stuff like that. You might you might want to actually see what you're doing. And of course light can attract attention. And then of course if you don't want the attention, well, you, you know, you wouldn't do it. But if you need to attract attention, maybe you're lost. Stranded, injured, and you need to attract attention. At least at night anyway, so light is probably going to be your best friend. Because obviously that can be seen from quite a distance away and stuff like that. Including, you know, indirectly signaling with a, with like a mirror, a signal mirror. So, for example, since I do have some light, you'll see some light behind me and all this stuff. I'll show you what I mean. Now this is not a signal mirror, but this is actually from a hard drive. This is a platter from a hard drive. I'm not indirect. I'm not gonna sh show it too much, but I'll not into the camera, but I'll show it off the wall or something like that. So you'll see that right there. Oh yeah, see. And basically, if you have some way to aim it, I know you can buy ones that have like that star flash or whatever it's called and it'll help you uh, aim it. But another way as a tip is use the V or you could probably do this too or whatever, but usually people use the V and put it into your, put what you're trying to hit, whatever it is, person, plane, helicopter, whatever it is, right? Put it into view and try to aim between that. So the light will actually go through your fingers. And because light, if anyone doesn't know or has known, travels in straight lines. So pretty much if it's, if you, if you can see that person in between your V and you're shining a light through it, they should be able to see that. For the most part, for the most part, but now that also requires, you know, pretty good light. Uh, I mean, pretty good sun, and also you can't do that, do, do that during at night, or and it's less effective on a cloudy day and stuff like that. And also, if it's raining and stuff like that, you know, and it's got to be in a uh, straight line, so it's got to be a line of sight. So if there's like trees in the way, you know. You want to probably get into an open more, maybe an open field and stuff like that. Because if you're lost and stranded and you're trying to get some help, right? You want to be noticed. You know, that's probably the aim. You don't want to be like so far in that no one can see you. And, you know, you can't even signal for help because you know, like the tree canopy is so thick above you and stuff like that. I know people are taking off. I do appreciate everyone taking the time to drop in. I appreciate it. I do appreciate you dropping in, by the way. Let me just bring back up my chatter. I'm just checking out some messages real quick. So, I guess that basically leads me... Well, I kind of jumped to the next section a little, but I'll come back to that. His light, like I said, you know, signaling purposes, right? This everything I'm gonna get into right here, which is number five on my list right here, is kind of the what I call safety, protection, and security. Because in certain situations, you want to be, you want to feel safe. I mean, I mean, survival. You want to feel safe. If you feel safe, you know, it's not as bad. 
in the protection side, well, we all know what protection means. Not that they're form of protection, but, you know, self-defense kind of deal. You know, I'm not going to show examples, but I think we all know what that means, right? I think we all know that what that means and stuff like that. And that's that self-defense kind of thing is kind of one of those things that you probably want to practice on beforehand, you know? I wouldn't want to just wing it. You know, maybe practice and stuff like that. You know, you know whatever it is, uh, the hammer strikes uh, and stuff like that. You gotta be careful when you're like per se like punching. It might hurt your hand, for example. And you know, there's other forms of protection. You know, right? All right, and you know, tools can be used as a form of protection. You know, cutting tools and stuff like that. And, well, security, right? Well, you know, you want to feel safe in your area that you're currently in. Maybe you're sheltering in place, bugging in and stuff like that. You want to feel secure, right? So you check around the perimeter, make sure everything's good, you know. You got that force protection or something, whatever it is. You know, and you have, if you have multiple people, you know, maybe you have people taking shifts, walking around, uh, taking a look, making sure your perimeter is nice and safe and secure and stuff like that. And, you know, and cycling it through every so often, shifting, you know, shifting it off to the next person and so forth and so forth. And the safety thing. Basically, you know, I guess that really inc includes, like, first aid, too. And stuff like that. Now, I'm going to show an example here. Now... First aid had well, there's a lot <laughs> that first aid can incorporate, but you know, for example, here's an ace bandage right here. This is a form of first aid safety, in my opinion. So something like this, you know, medical tape, tape, bandages. You know, a little, maybe a little bit beyond just band-aids or very small little bandages, gauze. Well, actually, I forgot to put the link in the description, but you can go check it out. I'll, I, I might put the link in later, but here's a pocket first aid kit. This is just, you know, this is more like a boo-boo kit for me, but and you can see the video on it. I do... It hasn't changed much, so you can go check it out. I forgot to put the link in in the description. And, of course, I have links in the description right now on previous videos I've done and a few examples of me using some of this stuff and trying it out and showing it, too, so if you want to go check it out, including fire lighting, the, ex the extreme fire lighting in cold conditions challenge, to uh, a water kit that I made previously that, it, well, that's changed since last time. And uh, let's see what else is there. Uh, oh, yeah, and the emergency preparedness bag challenge. Oh, have you seen that emergency preparedness bag? Guess what? It's right here. Oh, and, 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 and. And, for the rest of the stream here, I am going to wear it too. Why not? Why not? I'm going to do it again. I, I've actually worn this in previous streams, but I think I'm going to do it again. Why not? Why not? You'll actually see that it's all on me. And stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna get into this next part right here, which I basically orientation, navigation, and communication. Now, signaling is part of communication. Orientation is like stuff like maps, compasses, and well, of course, navigation. Well, obviously, you gotta get somewhere, especially if you're trying to get back home or get back to your vehicle, for example. Maybe you're injured from hiking. You know, you twist an ankle, well, you got to navigate back to your vehicle, for example. 
would be nice to know where you are in relation to everything else. So if you're at point A, you need to get to point B. Would be nice to know exactly where point B is, so you can get back to your vehicle, car, truck, whatever it is. Even if you gotta crawl back, right? I mean, if you gotta do it, you gotta do it. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed that one. Now, I know some of these compasses have like mirrors and stuff like that, and some of them have little magnification glasses and stuff like that. You know, ones that you can uh, spin the, I think that's uh, called a bezel and stuff like that. And, you know, try to, when you're navigating, you know, you're trying to keep your compass in the dark house, as they say, right? The Dito in the dark house. Because people actually don't walk in straight lines. We actually veer to the left or the right, depending on what's dominant. So when you hear people saying, again, walking in circles, it's because literally they are actually walking in circles. And stuff like pace speeds and stuff like that help, you know, to keep track of your distance and stuff like that. Now, I have, personally, I have to get a little bit better at that in in terms of my preparing yourself it I have to get a little bit better at that I mean I've done enough I, will, I know quite a bit of fire and stuff but I need to learn more about orientation navigation and communication and you know a few extra things that would help now this last part right here which I'm going to talk about is Transportation. <laughs> I know you're like, transportation? So this includes not only your vehicle, right? But ways to keep up your vehicle. So, you know, like jumper cables in the winter. To me, that's a, an extension of the transportation because jumper cables toe straps and stuff like that allow you to get back on the road and, well, move again. And if you can move again, well, you don't have to walk. And if you don't have to walk, well, you're going to get there faster and stuff like that. And transportation also includes footwear, you know, try to wear the proper footwear. So, for example, again, in your vehicle, maybe, maybe you work at an office or something like that, you know, Maybe have some a ch change of shoes in your in your car, vehicle, or something like that. So something happens, you gotta walk on foot. You got more comfortable shoes to transport your body, right, back home instead of wearing like high heels, flip flops, or whatever. Another form of transportation that I consider is like the footwear. So these are ice cleats right here. Well, ice heels, anyways. I sort of consider this as a form of transportation because, well, it allows you to move better, especially over maybe wet conditions, wet ground, or icy ground. Like, to me, something like this, if you get freezing rain in your area, for example, these are worth every single cent in freezing rain. Trust me. Trust me. I've seen people... And experienced it myself, become very, you know, literally downtime because they fell because of, you know, ice in the winter, whatever, like, uh, black ice or whatever. And, you know, I've, I've, I've even had a video. I've even had a video on a live stream where I've shown that I actually did sprain my wrist before this wrist right here. And it took me a month to recover from that. That was just a fluke, but, you know, let's just say uh, I started to wear the ice cleats a little bit more during the winter, at least. But something like ice cleats help during the winter, for sure. I mean, I've shown other ways of kind of indirectly, I'm not indirectly, but doing it when you don't have ice cleats. For some reason, you know, maybe there's a spot, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk and stuff like that. 
something like that in an urban area, and, and there's ice in front of you, you can see it, you know it's there, well, there's two, two, there's two options that I usually do, and here's some tips too, to keep in mind, first thing, try to go around, go around it, avoid it, you know, if you avoid the ice, well, you don't have to slip on ice if you're not on ice, you know, maybe hit, hit like a, uh, the grass area where or there's a place where with more traction maybe it's snow i mean snow can have more traction in comparison to ice another thing is if you have to because you know the snow bank's too high you don't want to be in the deep of snow or whatever but you have to cross this ice for some reason you know you don't have a choice or whatever another thing i keep in mind is go slower and Lower your center of gravity. Because in physics, force equals mass times acceleration. Now, you can't change your mass or your weight, per se, but you can change the acceleration because since you're lower, if you did fall, since you're lower to the ground, the time it takes to fall is not the, to be as long. So that means the force of impact in that equation will be less. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I'm just like, you know, I'm going to go, oh, I see this big ice spot, right? And I can't go around it. You know, there's like whatever in the way or something like that. Let me just bring it back. Because I'm moving it as I move along. Sometimes I'll like lower my center of gravity. Not like not literally touch my hands to the ground, but lower my center of gravity and maybe waddle a little bit. I've done that a couple of times. It helps, it helps. Especially if you don't have something like ice cleats with you or, you know, you don't have the best shoes or boots on you at that time. You didn't plan for it and you just wore runners out and stuff like that. You don't have boots and stuff like that. So I, that's something I keep in mind. I've shown that in a different video before. That's definitely something I keep in mind because I've seen and heard from stories from other friends where I I had a friend, she actually broke her leg. Now it was a clean break because of ice. My other friend crossing the street and they're rushing, right? Walking and slip on ice. I mean, like he, he kind of minorly, you know, sprained his wrist. Their back sore because of it. Or their hips sore or whatever. And it, it's kind of... Um, it's downtime. Because now you got to go to the doctor. you got to go get an x-ray and all that stuff. You're taking pain medication. You know, whatever it is for the pain. And it hurts when you're trying to fall asleep. When you wake up, you're in pain. Where, you know, something like just getting down a little bit lower. Maybe... I wouldn't say, like, squatting or something like that, but, like, maybe, like, duck walk, I mean, penguin walking over across, and slowly make your way across. Because a lot of the time, it's because ice is because you don't see it, or you're rushing. And because you're increasing the speed, right, it's more likely you'll probably be standing straight up, and you're going to slip out. And when you're slipping out, a lot of the time what will happen is like you try to break your fall with your hand or something. Well, you know what's going to happen? You're going to sprain your wrist. And what happens when you sprain your wrist or something like that? It's downtime. That's because now you got to deal with it. So if your wrist is injured, so if you sprain your dominant hand, if you're left or right-handed, now you got to do work with your other hand and stuff like that and relearn how to do stuff. And you're less productive at work, for example. You're in pain and all that stuff. You're complaining and all that stuff. You're waking up sore and all that stuff. Where something as simple as just getting down a little bit lower. So if you, even if you did slip out because you're not as high, you're not going to accelerate as fast down because you're lower to the ground. So that's something I keep in mind a lot here in Canada. And I kind of mention it every so often to people because... You know, like, I hear this stuff and just like, you know, it is preventable. Falls are preventable. For sure, for sure, right? For sure. 
Yeah, exactly. Rushing causes a lot of problems, especially when you're not mindful. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I tell people that all the time and just like, you know, go to go around if you have to. Something like that. So coming back to this transportation part, that also includes probably other transportation, not just motorized vehicles like a truck, car, SUV, and all that stuff, but that includes other transportation, including a bicycle, maybe skateboard, something like that. That's a form of transportation. It allows you to move quad, ATV, stuff like that. That's a form of transportation too. So, you know, having stuff that like, fix a fat a flat tire and stuff like that toe straps and like that I consider that more of the transportation part because it allows you to get your transportation your vehicle back on the road again so you can keep going yes exactly stay low to the ground I remember this one time I, I had there was like like, literally blocks of ice, blocks, like, you know, large section of ice, quite a long distance. I just, like, next to the, like, bend, just bending my knees just a little, like, so I reduce the, my height by, like, that much, give or take, you know, like, a foot or two. And, you know, literally, I was waddling and doing it fast. And I wasn't as worried, so... Even if I did slip out, the height, since the height's not as high, the force of impact isn't going to be as great, because you're not going to be accelerating as, as long, because, well, the time to hit the ground is less. So instead of standing straight up and walking and slipping out, or whatever, I'm down here a little bit, a little bit lower to the ground, and, you know, if I slip out, you know, the impact's not as much. Where, you know, you hit the ground with your hand or whatever and it doesn't even hurt. Just because you're so much lower to the ground. So that's just something I keep in mind. So these are the areas I've covered so far. And yes, I'm going to keep wearing this backpack. Oh, and this is my emergency preparedness bag. Which I've worn a bunch of times in videos. Which is also in the link in the description down below of when I did... The emergency preparedness bag challenge and I've done other things with this and yes I can jump with it as you can see and do all this stuff quite still nimble with it obviously you know any weight on your back or on you you know it's gonna reduce your mobility but I still have fairly good mobility providing you know I'm not injured or anything like that now I want to that was the gear and supplies thing. Which I'm going to show one more thing here before I actually get into the next topic here. Is because I also put the link to this video right here. That was the light cell blackout kit. So you want to see the contents in that. What's in this right now? It's pretty much the same that's in that video. It's in the link. In the description down below or wherever it is on your device of choice and you can go check it out that's just something you know grid those now power outage and stuff like that I got lighting options you know you know especially if I'm sheltering a place bugging in whatever you want to call it that way I can see what I'm doing and stuff like that so it's something like that happens I'm not as well, I'd still be worried a little, but it, it'll just be an inconvenience to me. It'll just be an inconvenience to me. I'm not... And, you know, this stuff, this kit is actually... You know, you'll see reflectors on it and all this stuff. It's in a ready-to-go state. Readily available... Readily available. Readily uh, noticeable in a more common area for me. So, something like this. You, you know, it's not have flashlights. You know, that kind of stuff in it. I put it in a very common area, so if you were to make one, create one, for example, to add to your kind of preparedness plan and 
strategy and all that stuff. You know, putting it in a common area, like uh, maybe in a kitchen, for example, dining room, something like that, living room. So, you know, you know, you have kids or, you know, other people in the house, in your place or whatever, maybe grandparents or something like that, something happens, and maybe you're not around. See, so a lot of stuff, sometimes you might, you might need, you might know the stuff, but you may not be around. You may be at work and, you know, the power outlet just goes out. You know, or the lights go out, for example. Now, I do have a couple of stories here. Speaking of power outages and lights out. The last three times I've seen the power go out. When I've been around. It hasn't been at home. <laughs> That's the funny thing. The last three times, too. Now, luckily these power outages or when the lights went out. It wasn't that long, you know, it was an hour or two at the most, give or take, but it, it was reminding me, you know, your friends might be over, for example, you know, and this actually has happened to me like 10 years ago or whatever it was, I think it was 10 years, it could have been like 8 or whatever, but, you know, these power outages go out and you may have friends over, well, and stuff like that. Wouldn't it be nice to know that, you know, that your friend had something ready to go, for example. Or you're at your friend's place, you know, something happens like a power outage, lights go out, you know, from thunderstorms, you know, whatever it is. That you have something like a light out kit or a blackout kit ready to go and... You know, you whip that out and, you know, they're like, oh, good, 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 right? So they're not as, they're not worried, they're not kind of concerned as much. I mean, still be concerned, obviously, but they're not as, you know, they're, they're kind of fight or flight response isn't kicking in yet because, you know, it's just, now it's just an inconvenience because you had something ready to go already. So, that's just something I have to keep in mind. Now, when I was at my friend's friends' places, I actually had lights with me, so it wasn't a big deal. And two of them were during the day, so obviously you don't have to worry about light during the day as much. But one of them was at night. It was at like 4, five, 4 o'clock in the morning. This was like, still when it was just like sunrises until like 7, or 7 o'clock or something like that. And... You know, and it's an apartment building and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a, there your apartment or, or whatever may have emergency backup battery backup type of lights. You know, or generator, but you know, let's remember that stuff doesn't last forever. And eventually it'll go down. I remember later on, like maybe an hour later, the hallway lights, they were gone. You went into the hallway, it was pitch black pitch black now the, the stairwells were still lit slightly but down the hallway you couldn't even see you could not even see you could not even see what you're doing now luckily that didn't last so long and it did come back by the time it was sunrise but it's just something i keep in mind now that you know some of these power outages and stuff like that let, where, when the lights go out may not actually happen when you're actually at home so yeah you might have a lights out kit at home and stuff like that. Well, that's not going to help you if you're somewhere else. So maybe, you know, having something on you, like, you know, maybe as part of your everyday carry, like something like a flashlight, for example, could be useful. So just case, you know, something happens, you know, suddenly, you know, oh no, all the lights went out. It's, it's six o'clock at night. I'm at my friend's place. You can uh, kind of reassure people, at least, you know, you, you had something in your pocket, for example. You know, I know there's like apps and stuff like that for your smartphone and stuff like that. And yes, my friend did actually start using it. But the thing is, the, lights, uh, the light function on your smartphone, it actually consumes power quite, quite a bit of power for what it is. For what it is. And let's remember, not everyone has their cell phone 
smartphone at a hundred percent. Some people are actually, you know, it varies, right? Sometimes you might get unlucky and power goes out. Yeah, you have your smartphone for a light source, for example, but it's down to 20%. Wouldn't it be nice to actually have a flashlight that you can use and conserve that battery life on your phone to make, you know, calls, emergency calls, and so forth and so forth. Maybe access information that you have on your device, like a PDF or something like that. So, that's why I like to keep one on me now. And besides, I'm a... I, I like to bike so often. I have that kind of gear when I go biking anyways, especially at night. Especially if I'm planning to be out after sunset. I actually will bring like a headlamp and stuff like that. So yeah, let me just put my light out kit back real quicker. So, uh, let's see here. Okay. Now, something else you may want to, like, kind of keep on hand a little is Now, this is a representation of it, is And if you haven't seen Canadian currency, this is Canadian currency You may want to have a little bit of cash on hand And it comes back to the power outage Depending where you are, right? Especially if the grid's down, ATMs, debit, credit card, those machines require power and probably a connection, like an internet connection or phone line connection to use. If the grid's down, power outage, you might not have access to your kind of debit cards, credit cards, even your uh, prepaid type of cards. A Visa, MasterCard, or even gift cards. You might not have access to it because it needs power to, you know, transmit the information and transmit it back. So, you know, maybe have a little bit of cash on hand. You know, cash is king, as they say. You know, smaller denominations, like fives and tens, probably. Because most of the time, probably people weren't, aren't going to have change. Or if you can't get change, you know, at least you have, like, a five on you. So even if they didn't have change or whatever, and you had to get something, whatever it is, at least you're not out of, you know, you only used a 5 instead of like a 20 or a 50 or a 100 or and so forth. Well, getting back to that real quick before I forget here. I almost forgot about it. Thanks for reminding me. But coming back to that light out having power and stuff like that and for for anyone that does any youtubing or something like that that does any live streaming and stuff like that where everyone's familiar with uh sorry guys i gotta go my uh my uh my phone started and i gotta cut this short well or something like that a battery bank like this battery bank that i have right here now it varies on the battery banks on how many milliamp hours that you have. Some of them, you know, have like 2,000 some, you know. Like this one, it's 10,000 and stuff like that. Some of them have an extra light source, like I have right here. Right there. As you can see, I'm not going to shine it in the camera, right? Out of respect, but that's a backup light source right there. It's not that bright, obviously, but this is a backup power option. And this comes back to that kind of... What I said earlier about the food, well, this is a form of energy, I guess, right? That, it's not for your body, but it's for, like, devices and stuff like that. So this could be used to recharge your, your smartphone, for example. So, you know, you had this on standby, you know, maybe, I'm trying to keep it fairly full. I just recharged this, like, the other day, so it's full. But something like that could buy you a little bit more time. You know, buy some time if you had to actually use your your phone. You didn't have a, uh, no candles, no flashlight with you for whatever the reason is. You know, because you're not at home. You didn't stock it up beforehand or something like that. But you managed to have a battery bank or a battery backup. 
that could buy you a little bit more uh, time on your device so you have a little bit more runtime for example and these can be used for a lot of different things I mean like if I remember right oh yeah it's uh, yeah here we go I've shown this before Here's a little USB light right here. You can see donated, uh, gifted to me by one of my Canadian subscribers, but I won't shine it in the camera, but let me just plug it in real quick here. So you can see it. So you, you can see that's a, now I'm using the battery backup with an LED light, for example. Not sure how long this would per se last for, but this battery's full right now. I mean, like, this is small. Look how small that is. I can easily, per se, just... Now I have a ranger man around it. I can easily just slap that in. So now, I have another light option. Especially if you're light, if your battery bank didn't actually have a light. Or, well, like I said, didn't actually have a light. And, of course, this one's a lot brighter than the one that actually comes with it. Technically, or technically, I can have both, for example. Now, here's a little side tip for everyone out there that uses, uh, like, a laptop and something like that. Something to keep in mind, just in case, right? Maybe you don't have a battery bank. Maybe you don't have a battery bank. Or maybe it's dead, or maybe you ran it dead, or you, you've already used it, for example. If you, For anyone that is using a laptop like how I am right now, well... Unless your unless your laptop doesn't have USB, a laptop could be used as a uh, improvised or as an emergency backup power supply, at least for USB power. Because for the most part, most people do leave them charge. Now you know if your battery if your battery on your laptop is not that great, well, that's probably not gonna be a great option. But it's something to consider. So if that did happen, obviously you might not even have Wi-Fi, so you're not going to be getting online anyways. But, you know, you can, um, you know, shut down your, uh, your laptop and kind of, kind of boot it into like, you know, in a more power saving mode and just kind of get USB power from that, for example. That's an option too. And, you know, as a way to recharge your smartphone, for example. Or device so you can read communicate right communication is important too you know give you that energy so you can actually communicate you know give you that energy so you can actually see with light what you're doing you know especially if you have other people around you know no one wants to walk on something or you have like uh you know kids and stuff like that or people that are older and stuff like that, grandparents or something, you know, their, their sight's not as good. Well, you know, we need help to have some light so they can actually see if the power went down or the grid is down for some reason. You know, lights out and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, maybe you, you did have a lights out kit or something like that, but you've already used up some of the supplies already, like the candles and the, the batteries are dying in the flashlights and you're like considering other options, so. A laptop could be another option for power. I do appreciate everyone taking a little bit of their time to uh, swing on by. I do appreciate it. I do appreciate everyone swinging on by here. Hopefully, hopefully some of this uh, information can uh, literally spark your interest into preparedness a little bit more and maybe it's not just for your benefit but you know people around you people around you your friends your family members the children your grand your parents your grandparents you know so something happens you know they feel you know they feel a little bit safer more secured you know they're not stressing out over something because you know, you had, you know, some sort of contingency plan in place, something ready to go. Like, 
the Lytel kit, which is in the link down in the description below. So you want to go check out that video on it. The link's in the description down below, so you can go check it out. And yes, I am wearing a backpack this, for the rest of this time on the stream, just like how I did that emergency preparedness bag challenge, which is also in the link, which also is available in a link down below, so you can go check that out too. And yes, I have worn this on a live stream. And yes, I am jumping with it. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So yeah, let me come back to something that's... Oh yeah, now I remember what I wanted to say. Having this gear and supplies, you know, it's very useful, very, very handy, and stuff like that. But probably even more important, even more important, here, see, the, it's starting to get late in the day, so I, I, may, I may turn on the lights, <laughs> just because it's probably harder to see me now, here. Yeah, let really me turn on the light, let me just turn on the light here, I didn't realize so, it's starting to get late, let me just turn on the light here, so, so I have, people can actually see me, and besides, you can see CRs in the back, alright, there, that's something I made in creation mode, if you want to go check that out, you can too. And yes, I am wearing a backpack, as you can tell. But even more important than just the uh, than just the gear or supplies is having the knowledge, you know, up here, the skills with your hands and stuff like that, and the mindset and the will to actually, you know. Do something about this. Go on. You know, to find a motivation to keep going. You know, for lack of a better phrase, to survive. Because you can have all the gear and supplies in the world, but if you don't know how to use it, well, it's not probably not going to do you much good. And besides, skill and knowledge weigh nothing. Although you have to practice it and learn about it beforehand. Because ideally you don't want to do trial and error in a real situ an emergency situation. Ideally you probably would like to have that, have known about this beforehand. You know, these skills and knowledge beforehand. And maybe things to keep in mind, tips and stuff to keep in mind. So, speak of knowledge. I'm going to show you guys a couple examples here of what I have in terms of knowledge. So, like, books and all that stuff. Now, not only books, right? You know, you know, maybe you want to watch YouTube or whatever. Go online on the World Wide Web to find information. You know, there's lots of information out there. And yes, I'm going to bring this back, by the way. So, there's a lot of information out there. There's probably ways of getting like PDF documents and stuff like that, which you could actually add to your smartphone, tablet, and stuff like that, so you can read up on it on your like lunch break, coffee break, you know, recess, <laughs> and all this other stuff, and kind of educate yourself a little bit more with some information. So, for example. I have one right here. Well, I have a bunch right here. I'm going to show these there two right here. Here's a book right here. Lightweight backpacking. This has lots of information in it. I mean, this this book is like... Let me see here without showing too much here. It's dated for like... Yeah, you'll see there. March, yeah, right there, March of 1974. This book is like 35 years old, but a lot of this information is still relevant. It's a, you know, but this, now this is for bypassing purposes, which I'll probably get into, but it, you know, it says, like you can read right here, it says about knots and stuff like that. You know, what's cooking, fire making, first aid supplies, sleeping, housing, camping trail, and all this sort of stuff. Beginning backpacking hikes, and all this sort of stuff. Clothing, you know. 
So if you're into hiking or whatever, you know, maybe you're uh, trying to hike, get into that for the first time, you know, you want to make a, you know, you're bringing a backpack, but you kind of want to bring some emergency supplies with you. Something like a last ditch kit or like an emergency kit, survival kit, just in case and stuff like that, you know, some information to read up on, to refer to, to learn about, to be useful. Now this one, you know, it's only a couple hundred pages, but I mean, like, a lot of this information still sound. I've read this a few times now. You'll see, uh, just let me just flip to something real quick here. Oh, here we go. Oh, wait, that's not it. I thought I had the right. Yeah, see. Something like this. Backpacking, right? So, you know, I can use this information to kind of help me make this emergency preparedness bag and associate with our information like this kind of seven sections that I have. Maybe incorporating, uh, you know, the seven, seven, the ten C's of survivability that Dave Canterbury like, likes to say a lot and stuff like that, and incorporating that all in and kind of creating something like an emergency preparedness bag, for example. Now, another thing here is learning about wild edibles and stuff like that. Now, I still have to get into that as more, but, you know, here's couple examples right here, well herbs, spices and stuff like that. I mean, I got this for a quarter. This one for a quarter. This other one I think I got for free. I mean, there's could be useful information in here. For example, like like this, like dandelions and stuff like that. You know, maybe more common things like cattail and stuff like that. I still have to get into a lot more into that to learn more than just dandelions or cattail. You know, and positively identifying it and stuff like that. I mean, something like mushrooms is probably, you know, something more advanced. You know, you probably don't want to get into that because obviously some of them are poisonous. You want to know and positively identify the wild edible before you consume it. And some of them, you know, need to be uh, uh, cooked or processed in some way to make it safe to eat and stuff like that. So, definitely, you know, maybe read up on it a bit. I still have to watch. I, there's still a lot in here that I have to read about. Unfortunately, some of these don't have pictures. I know some of them do, but some of them don't. Now, another thing is, now these ones I got for free, uh, next to free or relatively free, because they're much older. I mean, here's a reading material right here. I actually got this. Look, look at this. Yeah, the Swiss Family Robinson. <laughs> right? Here's a book that I could probably read and maybe, uh, remember a few things. You know, things to keep in mind, and stuff like that. I got this. I got this for free, actually. So I thought it was kind of cool when I got this. I was just like, you know, I could read this. Maybe learn a thing or two. Keep things to keep in mind. Uh, this one, I got for... F I think I either paid really cheap or got it for free. You know, there's useful information in it. It's kind of old, being mean, 35 years old now. From the time of this video or stream, but you could still there's still useful information here. Yeah, there's definitely useful information in here. You know, stuff like you know, clothing, right? Socks, socks are nice. Spare a pair of socks. You know, I talked about shelter for a little bit. You know, and stuff like that. You know, maybe idea, uh, things to consider about, like, your bag and stuff like that. You know, there's, it talks about multi-use items, like a bandana and stuff like that. 
or in terms of like the tendencies of survivability from the Canterbury, you know, cotton, right? Like a cotton bandana. But that can also mean cotton, like a cotton t-shirt, which you can make in the bandana and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now here's a book right here. Now, I know many people have this in the survival community. Some of them have the more newer version, some of them have the older version, I have the second one, and some of them have some people have the what's it called? The pocket versions of this, but yes, I have the SSA survival handbook. This is the second edition right here. I remember buying when I bought I actually did buy this by the way. This was not gifted or anything like that. But yeah. There's a lot of information right here. There's like 600 pages of information. I mean, like, there's a lot of... I haven't even read this all. I mean, there's a lot of information. Including, you know, thoughts and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of information in here. Things to keep in mind. It talks about wild edibles, maybe trying to put together a kit and stuffing like that. You know, things to keep in mind. Strategies to keep in mind, you know, things to look out for and all that stuff. Security, right? It talks about a lot of this, these sections that I've kind of talked about in this list, which is right there. It's a UN screen capture that. Yeah, see, I wrote that all down, so it's all good information right here. Things to, you know, you know, things like this right here, right? This could be useful. Useful information, just case. I mean, a lot of this stuff I still have to read. I mean, like, like I said, 600 pages of really useful information. I mean, like, it covers a lot for just a book, for a basic thing. I mean, there's more specific books you probably could get about, you know, building the perfect bug all bag or more about bushcrafting if you want to get more into that or that would dive more into like specific things but for like a general book then you can get I mean like at a bookstore I mean like this is cool you know like look right here I mean like survival at sea you know maybe you're on a a trip or going on a trip cruise or something like that you know this is kind of information you probably want to know beforehand so you know just in case just in case you know maybe it's a rare one percent chance you know if lightning strikes kind of deal, but you know, some of this information could be useful depending on what you're doing. I mean, there's other information in here too. Like, I mean, like, wow, I mean, like, not only like lashings, knots, and stuff like that, knots, you know, ways to preserve food. There's like preserving food, shelters. You know, this this kind of cat craft is more like a bushcraft type of section, I guess. Things about fishing, wild edibles, or things that are not wild, not edible, that are poisonous, you know. It probably doesn't go into great depth in compared to other books that are more specific about that, but I feel like, you know, this is, I, I swear I could read this <laughs> for a long period of time. And a lot of this information I'm trying to absorb, and then there's a lot of this I still need to read more about and kind of, kind of make it as my own in terms of getting it from, in this book version, and getting that information into here. And yes, I just did that. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to, what, through osmosis? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and stuff like that. There's, I mean, like, what? I feel like, you know, regardless of the price, this is this was well worth the price that I paid for. I mean, like, I, I just, I know, I just want to read it right now, but obviously, you know, <laughs> I'll do it on my own time. Yeah, exactly. If you're not 100% sure about, about wild edibles, you know, don't consume it. You need to be certain, for sure. Because there's like lookalikes, clo not clones, but lookalikes and stuff like that. And you don't want to miss and to identify something. I mean, you know, people know what dandelions are. I mean, like, there's certain probably wild animals that we do know of. A lot of people do know of, right? 
like garden variety type of wild edibles like rhubarb, apples, and orange, raspberries, strawberries, and stuff like that. But then there's other ones that, you know, if you didn't know, you might get confused with something else that looks very similar and you may identify it, you know, use, you know, you didn't smell it right, it didn't smell like wild garlic or uh, onion and you realize that's you consume something else and you're like, yeah, don't be like that, <laughs> right? Maybe learn about it and learn how to identify this stuff, know the characteristics of it from like, you know, the leaves, its shape, its color, even the smell. As far as I know, like wild garlic or onion, you know, you smell that wild, wild garlic or onion, it has that garlic onion smell, you know, you're pretty sure, I'm pretty sure most of the time you're gonna, that's what you're getting. So I'm just gonna put that back real quick here before I forget. <laughs> I know people are still coming in. I do appreciate everyone taking the time to drop in right now. So let me just quickly say hi. Uh, did someone just dropping in? Hello? Thank you for taking the time to drop in. I appreciate it. And for some reason, I'm gonna randomly wear a pink glove for the rest of the street. Because, and the other reason is, in certain situations, you know, you have to put your pride to the side and, you know, if your hand's cold, you're probably not going to care that the glove's pink. Just saying, right? You know, you gotta, sometimes you got to put your pride to the side and, you know, be like, you know, use the gear, right? You know, don't be squeamish with it either, right? If it's really important, if it's really important, right, it's, you know, and you're, you just make that judgment call and be like, you know what? I know wear this pink glove. I'm gonna, you know, make this contractor bag into a poncho because it's pouring out now and I still have to walk for another two hours, right? Versus getting soaked and feeling miserable when you come home, for example. Or getting cold and something like that. What's up, man? Oh, yeah. And by the way, yes? By the way, since you're here, yes, see, still have it, man. Of course I still have it, and this doesn't expire till like, 2021, so I still got time on it, right? I still got a year and a half on it, so. Yeah, all right, exactly. So I do appreciate everyone taking the time to drop in right now. And if you haven't checked out some of the links down below, right, you know, such as this emergency preparedness bag challenge, which I did. And yes, I am wearing the same bag that I've worn before in some of their videos where I do push-ups, clapping push-ups. Uh, um, what, what's that called? Planks. And, of course, I can still jump in it. As you can see. <laughs> so remember, if you're enjoying this right now, uh, give me a pink thumbs up. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But yes, I know what I might keep wearing this. Whatever, it's not a big deal here. And to the point, I'm. Oh, my hands are cold. <laughs> no, just kidding. I just don't wear this. Whatever, it's not a big deal to me. Because, I, I, like I said, I see this as clothing to help me, if needed, you know. And, you know, seeing things beyond just color or pink. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I do appreciate everyone taking the time to drop in right now. And stuff like that. Uh, let's see, where else, where else? Um... Oh, oh yeah. Now I almost forgot what I was going to say. About the budget stuff. Now, I've heard people say... Every so often, or... You might see comments on our channels and stuff like that, where people may say... Or you may hear, you know... Oh, prepping, preparedness, you know... It's expensive. I can't afford it. 
I'm on a fixed income, or they say something like, oh, I don't have the room to stockpile a bunch of food and water, and stuff like that. What I say is, you, you need to be more resourceful. There's a lot of resources out there that can be potentially used to help you prepare more. I mean, like, for example, here's a metal container right here. Like the one I showed earlier. Oh, wait, it is the one I showed earlier. I got this for two bucks. I can boil water in this if I had to. Store water, for example. That's two bucks cup of, for the price of a cup of coffee, for example. I'll show you guys something else here. You're probably like, oh, I can't afford a battery bank. Well, you know what? Here's one I got for free at a free place. I got this for free. Free resource. So this is not help me in that kind of energy or light department of this sections that I have ran down right here, as you can see. I mean, this one has light. On. See, it has light. For example, as I try to turn it off here, I'll show you guys more examples. I mean, okay, you're probably like, oh, I can't get, get it, ice cleats. Well, you know what? I got these ice cleats for free. Yeah, I got these for free. Now, I'm actually going to put them on shoes, I'm actually going to be putting them on boots. <laughs> In the winter here. Let's see. You know, and those were just options that I didn't have to use the cash for, the money for, which means the cash could be used as emergency cash if need be. Right, what I have right here. That's Canadian currency. We have plastic currency here in Canada now. For example. You know, uh, take advantage of off season, uh, out of season stuff, you know, clearance stuff. I mean, like these hand warmers. You might see that price. I got that. That's half the. I paid half that price. So pretty much this is like a two for one right there. Useful. And again, this is kind of coming back to that fire, light, and heat, right? Something like this. Buy you a little bit more time in the elements. Maybe it's cold out or whatever. You know, you're uh, hunting or maybe fishing, and it's cooler out, you know, something like this, it could be useful, that's an option right there, <laughs> okay, yeah, that too, right, that too, eating out, maybe eat out, you know, you like eating out, maybe take a little less, do, if you, if you enjoy eating out, maybe do it a little less often, something like that. Maybe, you know, you like that coffee, maybe you have coffee at home. And that comes back to, like, maybe buying in bulk. Buying in bulk. Buying in bulk is a good way to save money, too. You know, because you're getting a little bit more per, you know, serving size or per unit, I guess. <laughs> That's funny. I don't think I've heard anyone say that. Uh, let's see, what else, what else? Um, oh, okay, I'll show you guys something right now, too. Because it's sitting right behind me. Grad sales, yard sales, church sale finds. Sometimes you may find that rare, really rare thing, maybe once in a lifetime, right? And you're at the right place at the right time. Here's a Mora knife. Oh yeah, this is a Mora knife. I've shown it in vid in the video. Uh, see, as you can see, it's a Mora knife. It is carbon steel. I actually had to put a sh make a sheet for it. I got this for thirty five cents. Thirty five cents. So, you know, obviously you're not always going to get a deal like that or find something like that, but that's just another example of, you know, searching for the resources out there and just kind of, all right? I've actually batoned with this. I've actually made fetter sticks with this. 
and stuff like that. I actually brought down my last camping trip and stuff like that. I was actually making stuff with it. Because I actually made another walking stick <laughs> with it and stuff like that. So when I hear people say, oh, I can't do this or that, you know, I know it's hard, right? But you might just have to take a little bit more time and just go search for the resources. Like, I can understand that everyone can afford to go buy something at XYZ place or whatever. Or afford the highest quality gear possible. Like, yeah, granted, you probably want the highest quality gear possible. So it lasts long periods of time and you can use it often and, you know, it'll stand the test of time. But if you're more on a budget, fixed income, I mean, like, look for deals like this. I mean, like, look at that. I mean, like, 35 cents. 35 cents. 35 cents. I mean, like, I can't even make a, I can't even make a pay phone call with 35 cents anymore. But I got a full tang knife. That is full tang. And that is, like, probably older than anyone in the chat right now because it's, like, 60-some years old. Because it's post-World War II. And stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just got lucky. I got lucky. I got lucky on it, right? And stuff like that. You know, these places... You know... Take a look at these yard sales, grand sales, church sales... Around your own area. There's, um... Options like Craigslist. Or Kijiji here in the... In the... In... Canada here and there's I do have a place that I could go to to get free stuff it varies on the free stuff but everything in that place is kind of been uh, graciously given to be reused again so sometimes I pop in here and there just to take a look and that's where I found this battery bank this is a free battery bank now it's only 6,000 milliamps but still I mean like that gives me Something, I mean, like, for example, here, I really should actually put it back, actually, shouldn't I? Yeah, then we'll do, oh, yeah, here it is. So I could take this LED light that I got gifted from one of my Canadian s subscribers, plug it in, for example, or, right. yeah, here we go. Now I got a light. Boom. And I can run it off this free battery bank that I got for however long it will last for. I mean, you know, I got this for free. I mean, like, something like that. And then that doesn't even include making, creating something. Creating something. And that's another reason why I like creating so much because, you know, not only is it cost effective, but I get to learn how to make something. And I can make something really, really useful. Really, really useful. I mean, maybe, maybe you do help someone else out. Maybe exchange services for something, for, you know, supplies or gear that you can use. I mean, not specifically this exact, this one right here, but I've actually helped someone, like, watch over their place or something and they're like, oh, do you want anything in return? I'm like, you got any tools you don't need? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want? So, you know, I got this file. Look at that. I can use that file. For example. And one of the last times I helped someone, uh, help sit, you know, you know, to watch their place while they're gone and stuff like that. I got a free laminated map of this area. Those laminated maps, they're like, 10, 15 bucks or more, I bought them new. I got this, now I, you know, I obviously it might be outdated slightly, but it still gives me a map to use, and it's laminated. It's sitting in one of my bags now. So that's an exchange of services for gear or supplies. Something like that. Uh, let's see, what else? And coming back to the making things, I mean, like... Maybe you want to make a fire kit, for example, for your emergency preparedness bag, you know, 
your bug out bag, whatever you want to call it. Here's an example here. Now, I actually don't have a fire kit in here or whatever, but you probably could actually pro probably put fire stuff in here, but here's an option right here. Here's a draw tie bag. I made this all from scraps. All this is from scraps. And the stuff inside is actually scraps too, but I mean, like, you could make something like this. This was just reclaim. I'm reusing resources to make something to help me in the preparedness part. And not only that, I gained the knowledge of how to make something like this. So, if I needed to make this again or wanted to make this again, I can. For example, I mean, like, this cordage I found. And Cordage is one of the ten seeds of survivability from Dave Canterbury too, right? I mean, here's a draw. T here's a, here's a what's it called? A, a cord lock. I found that off a pair of gloves I found in the middle of the winter during, like, when it was snowing. The material. This is a reclaimed material from a couch to make something. So, you know, like, here's another one to ten seeds right here from, from Dave Canterbury right here. A container. In a container right here. So, there's an example right there. You know, I know you could probably go get a few things at the dollar store, Wish, and all this other stuff, but, you know, that's still money. I mean, I remember this one time exchanging, um... Uh, services for a gift card because I'm like you know I can get supplies at this gift card of whatever right so I did that I was just like I'll take a gift card they're like really you don't want any money oh. or whatever I'm like no 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 I'll have the gift card though <laughs> right so I exchanged that services for a gift card and the funny thing is the services that I did I actually made something to help me do the service better or quicker. So, you know, I'm productive, exchange of services for something else, which I can use to get gear or supplies with. Oh, I mean, when I hear this kind of stuff. And maybe, maybe, because you save this money from that, you know, every so often, and then maybe you're uh, saving them, Saving, you know, what they say, penny pitcher, pincher. Now, we don't actually have pennies here in Canada anymore. We have virtual pennies, but we don't have actual pennies anymore. But maybe from the money that you save because you got a few things for free that you didn't have to actually spend money on or whatever, or you created it, you can use it to get more food, more water, maybe something a little bit more useful. Or it's something you want to save up for, like a water filter, a backpack, and stuff like that. And maybe, and just maybe, you know, you're supplementing, like, you know, things that you can get in your own area, locally, like, 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 like these apples. Like these apples right here. Right, that comes back to the food part, the energy part, you know, and all that stuff. So when I hear people say that, I, I say, when when I hear say people hear people say kind of, oh, I can't afford this, I, you know, yeah, I know it can be expensive and all that stuff, but, you know, kind of look out for these kind of resources that you can obtain still. Maybe get for free, maybe exchange services for it, you know, and work a little add-in and stuff like that. Maybe wait till, you know, it's ready to harvest. Or maybe you're growing it on your own. Maybe you're making the garden. You know, you can't afford a lot of food or something like that. Maybe you're growing the stuff. And then later on, the money that you are saving, you get a dehydrate or something like that. And maybe you're making, making creating something like a, a solar dehydrator, which is something I've actually been thinking of. Now, it's kind of late in the season for me to do it now. Because obviously, you know... Sunset's like before 7 local time, so a little late, but I've think, been thinking about that because I was watching a live stream and they were talking about that for a little bit and I was just like, yeah, you know what? I've seen them. I'm like, I really should make one. I really should attempt to create one. 
And maybe next year, these apples may get dehydrated, preserved a little bit more. Last the winter, you know, so I can slowly, you know, increase the food supply, the stockpile on that kind of stuff. And actually have, like, you know, fruits and vegetables, per se. Let's see, what else? Um, yeah, I mean... Here on YouTube, I will be honest. You can jump on these giveaways. I do admit that. I do admit that, right? I do admit that. I'm not going to lie about that. But... Since the last time I won a giveaway, I've decided to stop doing that now because I've been trying to like give pe other people a chance. Because the last time I won a giveaway, and the person's actually here that I won the giveaway from, and I do appreciate it by the way, you know, I realized, you know, I want other people to enjoy that stuff too. So I'm going to give other people a chance. And sometimes, even if I do jump on these giveaways, if I do, I'm paying it for it now. You know, so other people can have a chance to acquire some resources and some gear too. Because I feel like I've been very, very fortunate to have some of this stuff. Very, very fortunate. I've been very, very lucky. You know. That's why the last time I won, I was just like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm paying it forward from now on. At least for the next while, anyways. At least for some reason, it cha I changed my mind. Ah. Oh. Well, yeah, you could, like I said, exchange services for, like, for something like gear or supplies or something like that. And, you know, that kind of bartering, I guess that's bartering, I guess, right? Because you're not actually using, per se, cash or something like that. You know, bartering, something like that. I mean, I've, you know, we're gonna file and stuff like that, which could be useful for me, just case and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, let me just see here real quick where I am. Oh, wow. Uh, I do appreciate everyone giving me the likes and just like the plants that like it. Yeah, I think I just made a pun there. Thank you for everyone for watering the like to make it grow. I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it. And yes, I've been wearing this backpack this whole most of the time. I I I don't even know how long I've been on. Wow, three hour, almost three hours. But you know, this preparedness talk, I probably could. I could almost talk about this kind of as long as I can do like creation mode time. I mean, I ain't got a lot to say. And here's, a, like I said, here's an example of my emergency preparedness bag that I have. Which I have videos on. Well, not videos on, but there will be a video later on about it. I got supplies in here. I'm gradually been working on it. And these, these bags, kits, tins, and such, right? Now, there's very small ones. I find those more to supplement or complement like, what you would usually would carry with you. So something like a backpack is probably going to give you a lot more options, more sustainable, longer lasting, buy you more time, give you more supplies to work with compared to like uh, a tin or something like that or what's just in your pockets or on your belt or in an Altoids tin for example. Now I've never actually had an Altoids tin surprisingly so I've never made an Altoids tin survival kit there. I made it from something else. And speak of which, that tin, those tins, I, I, I almost forgot, those tins I actually got in bulk too, so, that's another thing, right? Buy in bulk, buy in bulk. That's a good way to save money too. You know, money that you can reallocate towards something else. Buying, getting something like a dehydrator, a water filter, you know, getting that multi-tool that you kind of want. For example, you know, like, um, you know, some, you know, brands like Gerber, Letterman, Sog, you know, something like that. Right. Something like that, if you wanted to. 
you know, and take advantage of, like, yard sales if you can. You might find deals. You might find deals. I mean, like I said, I got a Mora for 35 cents. Yeah. You know, those deals don't always happen and stuff like that, but, you know, what I always say, and especially about scavenging, is, like, you never know until you go take a look. You may, that next yard sale, that next turn, you may actually find something. You know, I know on the rarity scale, that's probably going to be like an 8 for me. And stuff like that, but like I said, you never know until you go take a look. And I do appreciate everyone dropping in to, on this stream and showing that wonderful support. I, I really do appreciate it. I really do appreciate everyone taking a little bit of time to check and check on this out on my preparedness chat right here. Or C R wait uh right there. I do appreciate it. And yes, I'm not wearing this. <laughs> I'm not wearing my emergency preparedness bag for the rest of the stream until it's over. So if I give if I if I if I decide to cut the stream, you know I'm getting tired of <laughs> wearing it. No, but I'm still good. I'm still good. Oh yeah, so about yard sales and stuff like that, and community sales and stuff like that. Here is a bag that I got at yard at a community sale. I guess you guys are not get a really cool, really, really fast sneak peek. The story behind this is I got this at a yard sale back in twenty. I think it was twenty sixteen. At first, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but what I did was I created something with it. And of course, you know, it's got cordage on it. These cord locks got for free because I scavenged them from other things. And I made a backpack out of it. This is what I did. I've shown this before and stuff like that. The contents, you'll have to wait for the video on it, but I mean, like... With a little no with a little knowledge and you know scav not scavenging but like looking for resources or deals and stuff like that and a little bit of cordage and stuff like that and of course I you know braided some stuff on it and stuff like that oh yeah and this right there the cordage that's on there that I braided on there I got that for free because I found it right I made my own kind of zipper pull with it. And that includes, you know, and the knowledge of learning how to make a zipper chain in it, you know, boom, I got something here, right here, same thing, zipper chain in it, boom, there's our supplies in here, this is kind of my kind of low swim profile kind of bag that I can use if I wanted to, let's see, what else, what else? I actually don't temporarily take off this bag because I actually don't temporarily take off this bag. Not because I'm tired, because I need to show something else. Some of these yard sales that I get to find or see, for example, sometimes some of these areas and places that I t uh, go to. Some of these people actually have per se up. Let me see. Make sure I'm afraid. A free pile. So that's something I keep in mind to look out for. You know, for certain things. Obviously, not everything's always, you know, what you want or whatever. This bag, I got it for free. So what did I do? I made a 72 hour plus kit. I don't believe in the 72 hour kit, I believe in the 72 hour plus kit. Right? 72 hours is probably not dumb enough for most cases, in most situations. Especially some sort of natural disaster like earthquake, hurricane, storms, tornado. Well, tornadoes, well, yeah, even the tornado and stuff like that. Stuff like that. Tsunami, whatever it is. It's probably not dumb enough time. I mean, not enough. You want something a little bit more than 72 hours, so 72 hours plus, you know, 
or if you want to call it a bug out bag or go bag or get ready bag or you know there's a lot of acronyms for me or a lot of wor words or phrases you can say stuff like that hey thanks for dropping by man I appreciate it but yeah this bag I got for free And yes, there you can see something on the side. And I guess you could see a sneak peek on the trash bag right here, something like that. But yeah, this is a bag. Like, this is just a backup. Just as to supplement what I have, complement what I have. This is it's clearly lighter weight than the emergency preparedness bag I have. This is probably like half the weight because I could lift it with one hand. You know, if I needed a little bit extra, maybe I got a friend with me. Something happens or whatever. At least you know I got another bag. Of supplies that could be useful so even if they didn't have anything you know I have a spare I have a spare you know for example family member something comes over or whatever you know something happens you know whatever situation XYZ situation I'm gonna a spare so they at least they can have some supplies and if we had to leave or shelter in place you know then there's like now we got twice as much or a little bit more to work with and I'll actually show this right here, here, because everyone knows I went, I'm into creating a lot. Here's a bracelet. I made that from scraps, just for it. I mean, granted, it's not parachute, paracord, or something like that at the moment, but I could easily change it out in the future if I wanted to. I mean, like, because technically at the moment, all that stuff on this bracelet I got for free. Make sure I'm in frame, I'm not in frame at the moment. And stuff like that. Oh, you know what? Yeah, see, so yeah, right now, sitting on stuff, I got like a granola bar. Something like that. So, if you want to see. I know you guys probably like, oh, see, I show a little bit more, right? You're probably like, show a little bit more. Show a little bit of the contents. Well, you'll have to wait for that because this is just about the preparedness part of it and chatting about it a little bit more. So, Yeah, 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 you're going camping. Nice, nice, nice. You know, that's another thing too. I that rem that kind of reminds me of is like camping. If you are into camping or get into camping, right? You know, that's a good time to try out some of this kind of preparedness gear and supplies you have and see how well it works and works work, works for you. You know, and practice some of this stuff. Practice some of this stuff. Practice making some of those uh Ferrisium run spark based fi fires, right? And stuff like that. And then hopefully this will spark your interest in preparedness a little bit more. You know, maybe uh, try the try out that that knife, that tool, that axe, or something like that, and get a sense of it. You know. You know, it's a, don't be a positive thing if, you know, it works during camping, where you're camping and you're doing all this stuff, you know, that's a positive step forward. If it doesn't work for that, you know, in an emergency situation, you're probably not going to enjoy it that much then. You know, and maybe reconsider things and stuff like that. Maybe reevaluate your, uh, your plan for it. For example, uh, let's see here, what else, what else, what I wanted to share was, uh... Oh yeah. Here's some. Well, still coming back to that camping thing, you know. I'm practicing, right? You know, like I say in the end of my videos, you know, you don't want to reach a new level of skill and knowledge. Well, you gotta practice. You gotta practice it as much as you can, right? You know, so that way, you know, you acquire the skills. Maybe pick up some more experience, increase that knowledge bank, 
you know, and be stronger in that, in the mind, and in the body, too. And, you know, and your will becomes stronger because, you know, you have more confidence because you're like, hey, you know, I, I've tried this before. I know, yeah, I can do this. I can do this, right? Sometimes the will and, and survival is, in survivalism, sometimes the will is the, your strongest tool. If you got the will, sometimes you can really, literally will yourself to do, you know, things that you find were never possible. Or feats that were like, you know, I can't believe I just did that. Now, there is a series, I will actually mention it, because since I'm talking about preparedness and survivalism for a bit, is, uh, it's called I Shouldn't Be Alive, and I've actually watched it. There's videos on YouTube and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff, I mean, like, I've learned a lot from that, and just, like, some of these people, their sheer will, and, you know, peers, previous experience actually helps them, though. But their will to go and do things, you know, you know, and it almost feels like it's superhuman at times. Because, you know, they're, I remember, you know, imagine being so cold that you have to do, and your pelvis is broken, and doing crunches just to stay warm. That's all night long until morning, until it gets warm again. That is willpower right there. I don't even know if I could do that. I mean, like, I hope I could. I hope I'd never get into that situation because, I, you know, I prepared in advance. But just in case, you know, I hope I have the will for that. I mean, a lot of these, you know, things, to, you know, things to keep in mind, you know, maybe tell people where you're going beforehand, right? Something like that. I know that's one of the things definitely to take up take from those shows like that is most of the time it's because they didn't tell people and stuff like that uh you know like gear is nice to have and stuff like that you know and the more you have with you you know the more you have to work with but you know little skill and knowledge that doesn't weigh much if nothing at all you know makes that gear or supplies work that much better, work the best they can be, because, yeah, I can make, you know, I got a light, I got a lighter, I got a ferrocene rod with a mag bar, but, with the, ex with the knowledge and skills of being able to know how to baton correctly, feather sticks, increase the surface area, the knowledge of increasing the surface area, right, can make that, Oh, hey, I gotta make the survival fire or something like that that much easier. Because, you know, you, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Increase the surface area, you take that extra minute. So instead of failing or relighting and using more fuel, you, driving more sparks in, or wasting your only chance that you have because you only have one chance with the tinder source you have, for whatever reason, you get it on the first try. And then... It becomes more like, how do I say, you, your confidence will go up. You know, your morale will feel, you'll, you'll lift your morale because things are going, you know, whatever the reason is that you're in this situation, it's starting to get a little bit better. You know, try to make things better, not worse, as someone famously is starting to quote that a lot more. Something I keep in mind too, you know, try to make things better, not worse. Let's see here. Well, I guess I'll show one more thing. <laughs> About that free stuff. There's the solar light. Oh, by the way, I got this. I found the solar light. In a bin. For free. And I don't even know why someone... As you can see, it works. I'm not going to shine the light, but you get the point. I got this for free. Yeah, I got this for free. I don't even know why someone threw this out. It was in a trash bin. The story behind that is just actually I was going to the store to go get some. I just see it in there. I wasn't even sure it would work at first. 
You know, I bring it home, let, you know, next day I let it charge in the sun. It's been working, and I've been using it for, well, since. And this is part of, you know, the preparedness of, like, you know, having alternative source of lighting. And it also doubles as a way, so, you know, if I want to reduce my power consumption or whatever, you know, I can use solar lights and stuff like that. But, you know, this is another example of keeping your eyes peeled for stuff. Just taking a look. Because you never know what kind of resources that you can acquire if you don't take a look. Because it could be useful. That next resource, the next thing you see could be really, really useful. You know, you might be able to, you know, get that, those, how, um, how do people say, you know, get that score, whatever it is. And the money that you do save because you didn't have to buy something similar to that may allow you to buy another can of soup. Or get, save up and buy like a big bag of rice like I have right here. Yes, this is actually a bag of rice. That you can see. Bag of rice. Stuff like that. So I think I'm gonna end this live stream in the next couple of minutes here because I've been going for a while. Wow, three hours. So I do appreciate everyone taking a little bit of their time to drop in. I really hope everyone found this informative, you know, and maybe get your interest into preparedness, prepping a little bit more, you know, and create a better future starting today. Maybe to create a survival kit, you know, creating that, that, uh, food storage, you know, maybe making an organizer so you can actually have more stuff to stock up, you know, food, water, you know, stuff like that. I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it. Everyone taking a little bit of their time to drop in. And I did show a few little things and stuff like that. Some examples, a few things I have. So you can actually see actual visuals and stuff like that to go along with the information. And, you know, like I said, I have it written down right here. These are areas I keep in mind. Those are areas I keep in mind. When I'm doing this now. Including, you know, some other things that people have. Stuff like that. You know, the seven, seven, the ten seeds of survivability from Dave Canterbury. And so forth and so forth from other people. You know, I keep that all in mind, you know. And remembering, you know, gear is nice to have. Gear is nice to have, of course, of course, you know. I think anyone can agree that gear is nice to have, you know. And we love it, you know. I won't I won't deny that either. But let me ask everyone this right here. Take all that gear away from you, and what do you have left? The knowledge up here, the skills in your hand, your willpower and your mind. That's all you have left. So if you increase your skills, your knowledge, strengthening the mind and the body, I guess, too, you know, and develop that willpower a little bit more, however you can, you know, it'll make that gear that you do have, however little, just that much better. Just that much better. Just that much better. So skills like, like I said, like example, like not. I mean, this is a zipper chain sitting right here. I mean, here's a fast, really, really fast bowline knot, fixed loop. One, two, three, four, five. I think I have it right. I guess I need to practice this. See? Like I said, sometimes you... You know, you gotta practice the stuff. Sometimes, you know, so, you know, when you're doing it, it becomes like next. 
Oh yeah, that's because I went. I, oh yeah. You gotta practice this stuff. Some of these skills are perishable. Or you might forget them or something like that. See, I'm not. For some reason, I'm not doing this, but why not correctly? <laughs> See? See, sometimes even I kinda have to remember to practice this stuff every so often. I think it's the way I twisted it. I was trying to twist, make a loop, loop towards you guys instead of, I mean, away from me. I mean, towards me instead of making it towards me. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, see? The line. Fix loop right there. Mm -hmm. See? I gotta practice it. Because clearly I didn't do it right. <laughs> the first time. But if you practice a little bit more, you know, you'll get better at it. You'll get better at it. And one day, you know, eventually it'll become muscle memory. And you, you'll be able to do it without even looking. Blindfolded. Maybe even with gloves on and stuff like that when, with little dexterity. And maybe you'll be able to do it even with pink gloves on, like what I have right here. So thank you for everyone for taking the time to drop in on this preparedness uh, chat stream. Or, you know, it's not just about gear and supplies. But like I said, knowledge, skill, willpower, and the mind. So, like always, we can all create a better future starting today. So, outro time. As the world changes so much oneself to reach a new level of skill and knowledge, one must practice. Clearly, I have to at times. <laughs> now, one person can't help everyone in this world. But one person can help someone in this world. And until the next video, live stream, static video, popping in on the side chat, or on a panel, it's peace out from the guy that's trying to get into and learn more about preparedness and create that, you know, create a better future starting today. Peace out from you know who, CR, and I will catch you all next time. Thank you everyone for dropping by this stream, and take care all.